tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's program, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with audio adaptations of six rounds of frightening fiction about mutilated marshlands, sacrificial secrets, ancestral adventures, cured car rides, disturbing drawings, and pernicious pirates. I'm Otis Jivey, host of the Scary Stories Told in the Dark podcast, now in its eighth season. My show is available on iTunes and wherever podcasts can be found. So if you enjoy all things spooky, come on over to my neck of the woods and check us out too. You won't be sorry you did. Joining us tonight to help bring the frightening fiction of Heath Pfaff, N. M. Brown, Edith Pax Boyer, Micah Edwards, Grant Hinton, and Raz T. Slasher to life, our voice talents, Paul J. McSorley, Jesse Cornett, Melissa Exelberth, Melissa Medina, Eric Peabody, Luke Fisher, Heather Thomas, and Danielle Hewitt. Now, get your ticket ready, take your seat in our Theater of the Minds, and brace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Our first tale tonight comes to us from author Heath Pfaff and is performed by Chilling Tales for Dark Knight's voice talent, Paul J. McSorley. In it, we'll meet a field exploration and area reconnaissance team touching down on a planet called Cadius. 4A. Their mission is to extract and recover anything available that the failed crew before them had left behind and to hopefully see what went wrong. But will their futures lead to the same fate once they find out exactly what that was? Without further ado, I present to you Harvest Man. Plummeting through the sky in free fall as fire licks up around you, trying its damnedest to erase you from existence, never gets easier. I was old enough to have forgotten more drops than I remembered, but that feeling of your stomach trying to crawl up and out of your throat somehow managed to feel fresh each time. The window on the pod door was so bright with friction fire that I had to close my eyes, even behind the glass of my safety visor. I kept them closed, too, until the red coming through my eyelids went dark. Below me, coming into view through the clouds, was an alien terrain that looked like it was woefully depressed to see me. Bog and swamp consumed where there was anything to see. Everywhere else was a thick fog that had an unsettling yellowish tinge to it. The planet was called Cadius 4A. Cadius was the system and it was the fourth planet from the red gianted circle. The A stood for adaptable, which meant that it was a planet that could support human life with certain acceptable adaptations necessary. Final determinations on the safety of the planet hadn't yet been established, but the scientific crew sent to make those determinations hadn't checked in for the last four cycles. That seemed to bode ill, so that was why we were dropping in. In this kind of case, the men in charge preferred to send in a small fire team of scouts who were familiar with planetary recon on frontier worlds. 
field exploration and area reconnaissance teams, fear troops, were usually the first town on a new planet to begin with. They picked safe landing spots for the scientific teams to follow. However, when something went wrong, then we had to come back, figure out what had caused the failure, and attempt to extract the crews without suffering losses that could cripple company interests in the area. You see, the scientists were replaceable, but their ships, capable of landing on a planet and lifting back up into space under their own power, and the equipment they carried down to the surface, those were expensive tools. Officially, we were looking for the crew and ensuring their safety, but our actual task was to recover the Far Reach 951 and her equipment suite. If we had time and could do it without too much trouble, we were to bring the crew back as well. Though I always went down, intending to bring them back. The atmospheric brakes hit hard. I was jerked against the harness in the pod as the outer shell opened its spinning wings and began to convert momentum into energy for the repulsors that would stop us from crushing against the surface like a can beneath a boot heel. Brace for repulsor fire in eight, seven, six. The voice of the computer was the final warning before impact. I took a few quick breaths and then inhaled, exhaled, and relaxed my body. For a moment, everything was in complete chaos of motion, pain, light, sound. Nothing made sense, and then the hiss of the capsule's door releasing brought it all back into clarity. We were down. I had survived another drop. I checked the heads-up display in my visor and saw that the other two drop craft were safely down as well. As the drop leader, I had to report our status. Caddy is stationed. This is Fear 8 Lead, Sentinel. We have made planetfall, commencing operations. Next scheduled report is in one hour. Confirmed, she chirped. I shifted back to the local secure comm line. Tower, corpse, on channel? Coming up on the left, Tower answered, his voice deep and resonant. He was a big guy, and his voice gave it away even before you saw him. I'm about 130 yards ahead. I'll run scans and wait. Corpse was the lucky man today. He got to sit and relax while the rest of us marched over unfamiliar terrain. He was no fun to talk to anyway. He never had much to say. All right, Corpse. En route, I responded. The sound of crunching and sloshing off to my left informed me that tower was getting close. I'm going to try to raise the Far Reach crew, I said, then dialed into the local emergency frequency. Far Reach crew, this is Fear 8. We are here to assist you in any way we can. If any of you are able to broadcast on local channels, please apprise us of your situation as soon as possible. I waited a few minutes, repeated the message again, and then set it to automatically repeat every five minutes after. Tower came into view on my side as I shut off the output to the public and placed it back to secure. The comm system was an insert that plugged in behind our ears and interfaced directly with our neural mainframes. It was much higher tech than the comms most people had installed in their heads. It meant we had to have an additional antenna running up the back of our skull and down through our spine, but the range and signal clarity was amazing. Compared to some of the more specialized environment modifications some people willingly took on, our gear was at least subtle. Out of uniform, we only had a few ports to show that we were modified. The land was swampy and traversing it was slow going. After a few minutes of advance, I decided to check on Corpse. Corpse, how are those scans coming? My readings were nil for the movement beyond Tower and myself, and we weren't yet close enough to pick up Corpse. Not while we were walking. I waited for the reply. A minute passed in silence and I looked over to see Tower looking at me. Beneath his visor, I could see the tense expression that asked me wordlessly, Are we good? Corpse, check in. I tripped on the radio, checking the local map. We were approaching where his drop pod had landed. Scans are coming in, Corpse said, and I let out a breath I hadn't realized I was holding in. I thought I saw something. A white environmental suit. His voice cut off. There was a crackle on the line and then a fast beeping that indicated there was a transmission on the emergency line. Help us. A voice rattled in my ears. 
We are waiting for help. It sounded strained, as though the person speaking was having difficulty forcing air through their vocal cords. Far Reach crew, please activate your suit beacons so we can find you. What is the nature of your situation? I replied. If they were still alive, why hadn't they patched their comms to the ship and sent for help from the station? We had had no contact in a week, and I had expected that we were coming down for an equipment-only recovery. An ease settled in like a weight added to my equipment pack. We walked as we waited for a reply, and it wasn't long before we reached Corpse's drop pod. He wasn't there. I cursed quietly and swapped frequencies again. Corpse, where are you? I asked, keeping my voice as calm as possible, though I was feeling edgy. I'd been in situations where things went sideways before, and this definitely had the makings of one. Tower came up to my side and leaned on a strange tree next to where the pod had landed. This place sucks. I hate the damn spooky planets like this. Dark and swampy. No one wants to live here. Why even bother sending a crew in? I answered with a shrug. It's mostly about resources. The planet may be awful, but you never know what properties the flora and fauna might have that someone thinks will be valuable. Tower laughed. <laughs> it seems like the flora and fauna ate the scientists. Maybe corpse, too. In my book, that is less than useful. I'm sure someone would find that valuable. I offered my normal dark humor in reply, but Corpse's absence was gnawing at me. I had landed on so many rocks with him over the years that I knew he was a capable man. He was reliable. Corpse, if you can hear this, chirp or I'm going to eat your lunch rations. I wasn't sure if that was a punishment or a blessing, really. Protein bricks made you keep going, but they weren't exactly pleasant. Sentinel, north, 16 degrees. Tower's voice was low and urgent, which had me turning to orient my compass immediately. It was maglock to the far reach, giving us all a steady point of reference since magnetic poles were not necessarily stable on all planets. My eyes swept in the indicated direction, and I stopped when I caught sight of someone in a white explorer's suit. They were standing at the edge of the thick fog that covered most of the terrain, a copse of trees stretching up into the haze around them. Far Reach crew, this is Sentinel. We have visual contact. Please identify yourself. I spoke as I popped the proximity speaker on in my visor. We're here to help you get back to orbit. Who are you? I spoke out loud to the other person. Tower was sweeping out to my left side, his plasma rifle at the ready. I hadn't drawn my weapon yet, but I could feel this moment stretching unnaturally long. That feeling that something was off about this whole situation was starting to get more intrusive. About 130 yards ahead. Corpse's voice crackled into life on the private channel. Shit, Corpse, I thought you were... What are you doing ahead of us? We've got contact with a member of the crew. I let a slow breath out, trying to gather myself. Help us. The voice called from across the distance between myself and the Far Reach crew member. It had that strange force growl to it again. It sounded female, but it was difficult to tell. We'd like to help you. What happened here? I pressed again. The crew member lifted an arm and waved us forward, the motion jerky and unnatural. Something is wrong with her. Tower whispered into comms. I'm up on her right now, and there is something hooked to the back of her helmet. I grabbed the plasma pistol at my hip and activated the energy spin-up. I silenced my external speaker. What is hooked to her helmet? I asked, then toggled the speaker back on. I'm not coming over there until you tell me what is happening here, I told the woman. I don't know. I can't see. Let me get a bit closer. Tower's voice was as tense as I felt inside. Tell me your name. Tell me anything besides that you need help. I put command into the words, wanting something here to go the way it was supposed to. Sentinel, it's in her suit. Tower's voice on comm. What? I asked, the word going over the comm channel and out loud. I switched off the speaker. 
It's in her damn suit, he repeated in a harsh whisper. Something broke through the back of her helmet and is inside her suit. It's like a vine or something. It's going off into the fog. Tower was in the copse of trees now, close to the right side of the target. All right, keep your rifle ready. I'm going to move forward, but be ready to fire on my order. I leveled my pistol at the crew member's head and reactivated the proximity speaker. I stepped down into deepening water. The marsh between myself and the suited figure was deep, and it wasn't until I was halfway across the distance that I realized something upsetting. I was up to just above my knees, and Tower was up to his entirely. The crew member appeared to be standing atop the water. Tell me who you are and what is happening here now, or we will assume that you're a threat. I don't think you'll enjoy the way we take care of threats. I wasn't sure what made me keep advancing. Part of it was a certain confidence in my training, and part of it was idiotic curiosity. I was chock full of that. I drew closer. Help us. I saw movement behind the mask. I flicked my eyes to the right and used my HUD to activate the lights on my shoulders. Light spilled across the distance between myself and the other, pouring into the darkness and sending it fleeing out of the helmet. I couldn't understand what I was seeing. The human mind is designed to identify faces and mine was stumbling in its attempt to put together a semblance of order to the mess I was looking at. Help us. The mouth moved and that helped me find some order in what I was seeing. But that just made things worse. The top of the woman's head was fleshless. The skull shattered in such a way that pieces of it lay in the bottom of her helmet and cracks could be seen running down over the area that had been her eyes to the fleshy mouth that remained. Dark tubes had broken through her eye sockets and wrapped around the top of her splintered cranial chamber as though attempting to hold things together. I had seen terrible things over the years. I had gone to planets where alien viruses had reduced men to puddles of mushy soup and bone and seen men chewed in half by beasts that saw us as the bottom of the food chain. I once saw a plant that grew in human skin rip an entire group of people to pieces, but this was somehow worse. It was worse because she was still moving. I could still hear her voice and her arms and legs twitched and shuddered. Whatever this thing was either hadn't killed her or was making use of her like a puppet, and it was on an entirely different level of wrong. I pulled the trigger on my plasma blaster and then everything went to hell. It felt like the entire world suddenly surged upward, although there was actually no great upheaval of the terrain. The trees in front of me did shift because they weren't trees. What I had taken to be trees were the legs of some kind of insect-like monstrosity. It made me think of harvest men, those long-legged insects that were thought of as fairly benign on the home world. But this thing was so large that each massive leg was wider around than I could have reached. The body was nothing more than a dark shape in the haze above, but the tube-like appendages that came snaking down from above were born of a nightmare. They were black and fleshy, like frost-burned fingers, but as thick around as two of my arms together, and the end was equipped with what looked like a trepanning bore on a massive scale. Inside of the spiral, I could see blackened tendrils sliding around waiting to push out into whatever mass that spiral pierced, like the back of that crew woman's skull. A tree-sized leg smashed down into the muck at my feet, and I barely cleared the space in time to avoid being thrown down into it. I heard a woman screaming as I struggled to regain my balance, and then I was being grappled from the side by a white-suited horror. The arms moved all wrong, but they held their tight grip as they circled around me. I found myself eye to eye with the nightmare visage of the crew woman. Only now the glass of her helm was blown open and parts of her head were sloshing around inside the helmet, mixed with swamp and brains. A thick, dark worm tube came slithering out of the clump of meat that had once been a human head and started pushing its way in my direction. I did what any rational person would do in that situation. I started pulling the trigger on my plasma pistol. The weapon was facing the right direction and I was less worried about plasma burns and more worried about my skull being cracked open like overripe fruit. 
so I didn't stop pulling the trigger until the weapon overheated and locked. The body holding me exploded into pieces which caused it to lose the grip it was trying to maintain. Everywhere that flesh flew away, new tendrils sprang forth. I pushed away from the mess. One of those bore-ended offshoots pierced the space my body had been a moment before, slamming into a chunk of the crew woman's remains. There was a terrible squelching sound as something exploded from the end and out into the already wrecked corpse. The gun in my hand was hissing, the cooling coils fully extended as they tried to shed heat so the weapon could fire again. But I wasn't waiting around to see what happened next. I ran as fast as I ever had, running towards the far reach by instinct alone. The beacon on my compass was a guiding light. Tower? Corpse? Extraction? I panted over the radio as the trees in the swamp behind me began to move, probably in pursuit. It seemed slow, but it was so big, and those boar-headed tentacles weren't slow. No, they were deadly fast. Scans are coming in. Saw something. Corpse's voice crackled like his receiver was damaged. Fuck the scans. Corpse, do you read? Get to the ship. Now. The mission is a loss. We're recovering the far reach and extracting. There was more crackling and then Tower's voice. It's in my head, Scent. I can feel it in my head. The words sent a chill down my spine so profound that I almost seized up. Only training kept me moving forward. I was close to the ship. I didn't know what to say to Tower or to whatever had Tower. A scream came over the secure frequency and the volume tuning system activated to protect my ears. Tower's signal was open. It knows us, Sentinel. It knows everything. It knows. There was a cracking, tearing sound, and then the calm cut out. I was still running, the terrain making it harder than it should have been. Tower was gone. He wouldn't be coming home with me this time. I knew that. However, at that moment, I didn't have time to think about the loss of a friend. It didn't feel real. The sadness would come later when I was safe again. Corpse and I could... No, I couldn't trust Corpse. Something was wrong with him, and I had to at least consider the possibility that one of those things had gotten him too. Corpse, where are you? I felt numb. I could hear the strain in my voice the emptiness left by the horrors I'd already seen. I'm here, Scent. I'm at extraction. The calm hissed and crackled. That didn't fill me with the sense of relief that it should have as I dove through a line of thick, sodden plants and came into sight of the far reach. It was standing peacefully in the center of a clearing, lines of equipment out front as though the crew might return at any moment and get back to work. I'm almost there, but I don't see you. I tried to hide the trepidation in my voice. I couldn't see much beyond the ship. I couldn't see above it either, but I also hadn't spotted any of those strange trees I'd seen before. I'd lost the one behind me, I hoped. Sentinel, I'm here at extraction. I'll prep the engines. Corpse was still crackling on the comms, but his voice didn't sound right. My pistol had cooled its coils, so I readied it again. The engines of the far reach powered up, coming on in proper sequence as the test systems went through checks. I relaxed the slightest bit. Corpse was a pilot. We all were, but there was no way the thing eating people out here could fly one of our ships, right? I moved closer to the docking bay of the ship. It was open, and I could see up into the storage area and the crew quarters beyond. There was no sign of Corpse, but he'd be on the bridge now starting the takeoff sequence. Tower is gone, I said it aloud. I wasn't sure what I hoped to achieve with the words, but I needed to say them. Yes, he is, Corpse answered. Come aboard. It's time to leave this place. I looked at the equipment on the ground and then grabbed a few of the more expensive pieces and dragged them up into the storage area of the ship. I made two more trips, keeping my eyes open for those tree things. But then the far reach was just about finished with pre-checks, so I boarded. I looked up at the cockpit door, then back at the ramp. Everything was orderly. Corpse, you're still you, right? I asked, 
and then the ramp made a loud clunking sound which nearly caused me to jump out of my suit before it started to close. It was quicker than one would expect, and then it was shut. Corpse hadn't answered me. You're still human, right? I turned back to that closed door to the flight cabin. Those things couldn't fit on the ship. There was no way they could get up the ramp. I took a step that way. Corpse? My voice was barely a whisper. Come join me in the cabin, Sentinel. This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is proudly brought to you by Best Fiends. I don't know what's with this generation of kids these days. All the sex and violence in their video games, I tell you, that's enough to make a man sick. Back in my day, we didn't need any of that. Not none of your Mortal Kombats, or your Dark Souls, or your punks, frosted or otherwise. It's all so disgusting, I don't even know where to start. There's one where the guy from The Walking Dead just walks around with a goddamn baby strapped to his chest. That's all the game is. Just a dude and a baby, walking around. It literally makes me want to vomit! <sighs> I'm sorry for raising my voice. I guess I'm just showing my age. You know, my grandfather was a DPS tank in the war where brother smashed brother. You know, he got me my first PlayStation 1 for me and my brothers. Took all three of us to work the damn thing. One guy worked the controller, he had another guy working the bellows, third dude turning the crank. Every time I smell a charcoal grill, it reminds me of those summer nights. And that was back before characters needed things like facial expressions and contours, where everyone just looked like a bunch of cardboard boxes taped together. But that was how you tell a story. No, I'm the last one left. God damn, I miss my brothers. Jedediah got stunlocked by Slave Knight Gale at the end of Dark Souls 3, and he, um, he didn't make it. The last thing he said to me was, um, tell my wife to get good. Oh, god damn. Malachi, he's, um, he's still alive. He's just kind of an asshole. I don't see him very often. I just... I wish I had a game, you know? A game that made me feel young again. A game that could bridge the gap between generations. A game... a lot like Best Fiends. Oh yeah. How do you like that? <laughs> But seriously though, Best Fiends is pretty great. And puzzle games are not really my go-to. I generally find them to be a little bit too hard or a little bit too easy. But Best Fiends... Best Fiends hits the sweet spot. I play it all the time. I play it working out, I play it when I'm goofing off at work. Sometimes I just go outside and play it at the dog park. It always leaves my brain feeling like it just had a night of... Never mind. Like, um, like it just swam a few laps. <laughs> but, let's get into the nitty gritty. What is Best Fiends? Well, it is a match three puzzle game that pits you and an army of cute, creepy little critters against an army of nasty slugs. You're gonna have this grid and these objects, the objects, you're gonna wanna line them up. You line them up, they disappear. Boom, done. Lots of sexy rewards, you go and buy more critters, you make your team up, you come back raring to go for the next round, and there's almost unlimited rounds. They keep adding more. There's a lot of levels. And this game is almost too much fun. It will reel you in like Scorpion Spear, while other games leave you cold like... that other guy. And those creepy little critters, lovingly rendered, so endearing, you're gonna want to collect them all. I wish I could have plushies of them. Maybe I can. I'll have to look into that. Otherwise, what else is there to say? Just take my advice. Give Best Fiends a try. Just don't blame me when you can't put it down. <laughs> it's fun. Just try it.
Download the five-star rated puzzle game, Best Fiends, free today on the App Store or Google Play. Remember, that's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Thank you for your support of this program and of the sponsors that make it possible. I hope you enjoyed Harvest Men, as written by Heath Pfaff and performed by Paul J. McSorley. To find out more from Heath Pfaff, visit simplyscarypodcast.com slash Pfaff, spelled P-F-A-F-F, -F -F, and you'll be redirected to his author profile on our horror fiction website, creepypastastories.com where you'll find ways to follow him on his website, offfoxesmind.com, as well as a link to his work on amazon.com. By clicking his Amazon link on the profile, a small portion of your purchase goes to us here at Chilling Tales, where we're proud Amazon affiliates to help make this show possible. Voice actor Paul J. McSorley's talents can be found on our very own Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, as well as on past episodes of the Simply Scary Podcast. You can also find more of Paul's work by visiting Audible and checking out his many audiobooks. Just go to audible.com and type Paul J. McSorley in the search bar. That's Paul J. M. C. S. O. R. L. E. Y. You'll be glad that you did. And after you drop by, don't forget to let them know you heard about them here on this show. Up next, we've got a second sinister story for you, as written by N.M. Brown and performed by Jesse Cornett and Melissa Exelberth. In it, we'll be introduced to a husband confronted with a medical issue on his wife's side of the family, reminding him of an affliction he himself suffered in childhood. But the upheaval of old childhood memories bring forgotten secrets to life, ones that could very well be an unconventional and sinister answer to everyone's problems. Now, without further ado, I present to you the Mrs. Biddlespatch Special. Flashes of lightning illuminated torrents of rain as they ran down our bedroom window like tiny waterfalls, lulling my wife Meryl and I into a contented slumber. We always seemed to sleep our best during the muffled maelstrom of a Florida storm, but no amount of sleep, however deep, could block out my wife's anxieties. A sort of ESP, I called it. She shot up in bed a severed spider web of drool clinging to the corner of her mouth and chin. <sighs> what is it? I murmured groggily, startled by her sudden departure from her usual resting place across my chest. My wife looked toward her cell phone on the bedside table just as it started to ring. Meryl, oh my god, I'm losing my fucking mind. My sister-in-law, Debbie, sobbed through the telephone speaker. The intensity of her voice cut through my sleep-addled brain like a circular saw. It always fascinated me how much she and my wife sounded alike on the telephone. Derek won't sleep. The bumps are worse than ever now. They started out as small patches on his shoulders, and within eight months they've spread to his entire upper torso, front and back. Oh my god, that's horrible. My wife said sympathetically. What do the doctors say? I've asked them to test him for a gluten allergy a dozen times. They won't take it seriously. His doctor says she doesn't want to subject him to tests unless she absolutely has to because he's so young. Meanwhile, my sweet baby boy is turning into a goddamned prickly pear. And what's worse is the stress is affecting my health. I've been tired all the time, not to mention sick to my stomach. I've woken up with anxiety sickness almost every day for the past three weeks. I don't know what the hell I'm gonna do, Meryl. Between Derek's condition and my body's bullshit, I feel like we're both just falling apart. 
I ran my hand over my shoulders, letting their conversation fade into the inaudible, as a floodgate's worth of memories hit me from my own childhood. I remembered my mother working her nerves up over a skin problem I had that sounded very similar to Derek's, along with the Mrs. Biddlespatch special. Mrs. Biddlespatch was slightly before my time, a legend born during the youth of my parents. She lived in a small cottage-style house at the corner of town that was closest to the river. It sat at the end of a winding dirt road, almost as if God had thrown it there, the trajectory forging a path through the trees, debris, and brush that stood in the way. The lot that it sat on was overgrown with bushes, weeds, and vines, but she seemed happy just the same. Mrs. Biddlespatch had always been the friendliest person I'd ever come across in our backward one-horse town. She kept a clean home and crafted beautiful things, full of love and soul. She kept house just as a mother or housewife would, though she had neither husband nor children. God knows she sure would have made a fine example of either of those titles, but I assumed it just wasn't in the cards for her. And for all I knew at the time, she may not have even wanted to be in love or motherhood. Not all people who seem alone are lonely, after all. Anyway, the point is, the way that she came to be a figure included in my family growing up, for a time at least, was through her handmade soap. These days, they have almost everything that you can imagine. Hemp soap, olive oil, goat milk, black soap that lathers red, soap made with flowers, soap made with tea herbs, mango soap, soap that smells like bacon, you name it. But back then when I was a kid, you didn't usually see any of that stuff. You had your standard dish, laundry, and body soap. You got three or four colors with even less scent options. You wouldn't find any blueberry almond scented dawn with aromatherapy benefits on the corners of our sinks. You got the yellowy orange shit and you liked it. Once in a while, on occasion, you'd see the green stuff, but most of it was Neutrogena amber colored. You get my point. Well, Mrs. Biddlespatch's soap was different. It was a gorgeous, crisp white with crimson red swirls. It held all the allure of tie-dye before the boom of the 1970s brought it forth in Technicolor. And the smell... Oh, the smell was wonderful. It didn't smell like a field of flowers or a dance club rapist. It was earthy and robust. It had the underlying scent of cleaner, so you know it did the job. But it left you smelling... wholesome, if that makes sense. No two people that bathed with it smelled the same. It was like it brought out a sweetness to the natural essence one already contained. You know how sometimes when people die, their loved one will smell their clothes long after they're gone? Some even go as far as to seal them in airtight bags or sealed containers to keep it from fading over time. It wasn't their perfume or cologne. It was them. That's the kind of thing I'm talking about. Those weren't the only distinguishable benefits either. It also, and I swear to God this is true, cured most any dermatological ailment that a young child could develop. Mothers across the majority of the entire town swore by its use, with testimonials ranging from laundry soap and pet dander allergies to the extremist cases of diaper rash to eczema and beyond. My epidermal demon appeared when I was only a few months old. A smattering of strawberry-colored marks ran across my cheeks, mouth, and chin. My parents initially thought it was wind rash, due to me being born weeks before one of the most brutal winters the state of West Virginia had seen during my parents' lifetimes. However, it soon presented itself on the bottom of my neck as well as the top of my shoulders, only now it had evolved into tiny braille-like dots. The pediatrician my mother took me to couldn't find out what was wrong exactly, but that doesn't mean she didn't try. 
A parent, teacher, or doctor's body language, mannerisms, and tone can be read by a child almost effortlessly, long before any school book. So when the doctor and my mother loomed over me with worried expressions asking if my tummy hurt, I nodded. To regain some semblance of personal space and control back in the situation if nothing else. That one little nod subjected me to several weeks of torture that I'm thankful to barely be able to remember now. The doctor sat across the table from my mother as she wrung her hands with fretful obsession, making the tension in the air that much more tangible as she waited for a diagnosis. She looked my mother straight in the eyes and said, celiac disease. I spent the next 23 days doing blood trials, as my mother called them. They placed me on a variety of diets, with each change in menu item resulting in another round of blood work. I had been stuck more times than a spinster's pincushion by the time that summer was through. And what's worse, my parents' insurance company was beginning to give her and my father a hard time. All the while, the bumps continued to spread. By the time I turned four years old, they stomped mere inches above my elbows and covered most of my upper back. In the end, it didn't matter what the hell I ate. One day, in line at the pharmacy while picking up one of my many prescriptions that didn't do a damn thing, Mom ran into one of her old co-workers she said she hadn't seen in ages. I had certainly never seen him before. Well, the fella told her about the soap, called it the Mrs. Biddle's Patch Special. He performed quite a spiel, so effective in fact that my mother got right out of that line and headed over to the address the man had given her. Her eyes were wild driving over the hills and dips of that old dirt road. At the time, I thought they were burning with the flames of hope, but thinking back on it, it very well may have been fear that placed that look there. I remember her saying in later years that she almost turned back. I'm forever thankful that she didn't. And from that point on, from that very first bar of soap, my skin was as smooth as a normal baby's ass. And there were no more needles or doctor's visits. No more being forced to dress in high-collared and long-sleeved shirts. My mother bought tank tops for me for the first memorable time in my life. And things took a turn for the better, and it gave my mother the confidence to overcome great things. Including my father's suicide. And with all the good she was doing for the children of these families, I often wondered why she didn't sell her product to stores, pharmacies, and pediatricians' offices. And I certainly wasn't the only one. Young parents and nurses in training must have asked her at least thrice a month. Whenever asked, she would simply say that the best kind of love came in small batches, and how industrialization and consumerism ruined everything. I'd been so wrapped up in nostalgia that I hadn't realized Meryl had gotten off the phone. Her right hand was at her mouth frantically chewing on any scrap of nail she could get a hold of on her already bitten down fingertips. I recognized this as something she did in extreme times of stress. Oh boy, I thought to myself, here we go. <sighs> what now? I asked a bit more aggressive than I had meant to. It was the middle of the night. I was tired, you know? Debbie's, uh, Debbie is pregnant again. She just found out yesterday, almost ten weeks along. Oh, Christ, Meryl. That's the last thing she needs. Does she even want the baby? I swear, I've never seen a grown woman make so many child... I stopped upon seeing the look of hurt on my wife's face. My apologies. I muttered. Please, continue. Well, fuck, Jerry. No, she doesn't want the baby. You know carrying it to term will destroy her back and spine? She replied fretfully. 
She then raised a hand and began ticking off statements on her fingers as if it were a grocery list. So now she's alone because her husband took off. God knows who this new baby belongs to. She drew a finger down into the center of her palm, leaving four remaining. She barely makes enough to support one kid, rent, gas, and everything else it takes to live. A second finger dropped to join the first. The kid living out of utero is turning into a living reptile. A third finger fell. She can't work because of her back. The list goes on and on. My mind drifted back to Mrs. Biddlespatch and the day she disappeared from our lives. I remember walking in the front door after getting off the school bus during my fourth grade year. Our house, which usually held the smell of a cooked dinner in the air, was empty and cold that day. My mother sat at the kitchen table bleary-eyed over a half-empty bottle of gin. Jerry, listen to me. You are not to see or talk to your Mrs. Biddlespatch anymore. Do you understand me? Her tone wavered with the thread of oncoming tears, but somehow still managed to hold firm. At the time, my young mind couldn't grasp any comprehension of why she would want to keep me away from this sweet lady, one that had helped our family so much over the years. I could hear my mother and stepfather discussing it later on that evening, long after she had already put me to bed. She's lucky I haven't called the fucking cops. My mother hissed in a hushed tone. Her angered breaths quickly melted to sobs before she continued on. Poor Cherry, my poor sweet baby boy. My stepfather, David's boots, made booming sounds, clanking across the kitchen floor as he walked to my mother's side. I pictured him placing a hand on her shoulder, something he was well known to do as he spoke. Jerry will be just fine, Lee, he soothed. This really is none of our business. And we were just fine before we found out and we'll be just fine after. He paused a moment, letting my mother's sobs consume the room they resided in. Jesus Christ, sweetheart, what in God's name did you see over there anyway? Her wails grew louder and I heard her stifle a gag. Damn it, baby girl. Why won't you tell me? I knew that if my mother wanted me to stop doing something, nothing could get in her way. Not even my own sure willpower and defiance. I kept thinking of her at home, sitting all alone in the empty house. She'd never had any children, and to my knowledge, I was the closest thing to fit the bill. A pain bloomed in my chest to imagine her thinking she had done something wrong to make me abandon her. I'd always felt a closeness to the woman, but I never understood why. Not until later on, at least. Life moved faster than I'd have liked it to, and before long, I was living on my own. I'd lost several of my memories of Mrs. Biddle's patch and childhood comforts replacing them with things more appropriate for my age, such as smoking pot, and gaming, and getting girls. I'd almost forgotten her completely, I'm ashamed to admit. And that all changed one Thursday afternoon. I was sitting on my futon, stoned out of my gourd, when my phone began to ring. An involuntary groan escaped my lips as I recognized my mother's number on the caller ID. I cleared the rattled bits of phlegm that had settled in my chest after a morning's worth of smoking before picking up the phone. <clears throat> hey, Mom. I grumbled. You doing all right? Hey, Jer, listen. You will never guess what I heard today. She chattered. The manner in which she said it left me wondering if she was concerned or excited. Well, I, I don't know, Ma. If, if it was about me, I can assure you it isn't true. I joked, 
holding my free hand up in defense despite the fact that she wasn't able to see it. Ha ha, very funny. Now, my friend Martha told me that poor Mrs. Biddlespatch had a bad fall last week. They housed her at a rehab center until she's well enough to go home again. Can you believe it? She's hardly ten years older than I am. My mother exclaimed woefully. Um, Biddlespatch? I murmured. Um, that sounds familiar. B Biddlespatch, Biddle... Wait. Wait, she was the lady that made the soap. That's right. She confirmed. So, whatever happened to make you so mad at her anyway? Did she hit on David or something? I joked, though carefully. David had become sick earlier in life than he should have. We had no idea how much longer he'd be around. It worried me at times so much that I did my best to avoid thinking about it. I kept it folded up and tucked away tight in a pocket that lay deep down in the part of my stomach where Dread was born. My joke was met with silence on the other end of the line. Hello? Mom? Did I lose you? She drew in a long breath, signaling that she was mentally preparing for whatever it was she was about to say. No, I'm here, sweetie. I I'm here. She trailed off. Okay, good. I thought we got disconnected. Anyway, as I was saying, I used to go over there all the time, even on holidays most years. And then suddenly one day it all just stopped. I pressed on, hoping for a better answer than the heavy sighs I was currently receiving. And that's when she finally broke down, telling me everything that I thought I wanted to know. According to my mom, after a few years of faithful use, she began to notice a problem pattern with the soap. Some of the batches she made held more of a pink tint than anything else, almost as if they came from leftovers. The scrapings from the bottom of a forgotten batch. The smell wasn't as strong and the effects seemed even less so. The redder, the better, she'd always say. Well, she said that one day she dropped by Mrs. Biddle's Patch's house unexpectedly. Just a random thought that popped in her head on the way home from work. And there was no answer from within the house. However, the front door was unlocked. She could have sworn she heard muffled, agonized whimpers coming from somewhere towards the back of the house, so she let herself inside. She followed the sound, gasping upon opening the door to the room it was coming from. I remember my mother shuddering in horror as she explained the scene she came across. My mother found Mrs. Biddlespatch writhing in pain on her bathroom floor. The entire interior of the woman's master bedroom and bathroom was bathed in a pristine white, everything from the paint to the fixtures and accessories. Half of the floor, tub, and the bottom of the toilet were speckled with heavy ribbons of crimson, reminding her of the very soap she likely made there. Mrs. Biddle's patch clutched at her stomach while rolling into a ball. The entire hem of her nightdress was drenched in shades of sickly browns and reds. She had pulled it up past her knees as she lay there, exposing mottled chunks of red that had collected in a metal tray between her knees. It had all the markings of a miscarriage or at-home abortion gone wrong. But my mother had never seen any men enter or leave the house in all the times she'd been there. There were no smiling pictures of her in a gentleman's arms on the walls. The title of Mrs indicated that at one point there was a mister, but she'd never mentioned him and we certainly never asked. I didn't feel right to bring up a subject that could possibly cause pain or discomfort to someone that had brought so much peace to our lives. The largest of miracles can come from the smallest of things, like a simple bar of soap. My mother ran to her side, offering to call an ambulance, a gesture that Mrs. Biddlespatch vehemently refused. She told my mother her discomfort was almost at an end, 
and that it was perfectly normal for what she was going through. The woman did, however, allow her to stay until she felt strong enough to make it safely into her own bed. And that's exactly what my mother did. According to Mom, once Mrs. Biddle's patch was safely tucked in her bed, she began to clean the bathroom. Mrs. Biddle's patch screamed in terror when she saw my mother walking towards the trash bin with the metal tray. My mother apologized immediately, assuming the woman she'd come to love so much had planned to bury the remains. But just as Mom was leaving the room, Mrs. Biddle's patch, in and out of pain, said something very unusual. She told my mother to put it in the side room with the others. To this day, she's never told me or anyone else exactly what she saw inside that room. All I know is my mother ran out of there screaming, came home, sat herself at the kitchen table, and began to drink. She said that Mrs. Biddle's patch confided in her through her bouts of pain and unconsciousness that she had been cursed with a unicornuate uterus, making full-term pregnancy almost impossible. For a woman with her condition to have a pregnancy last longer than four months was a divine miracle. Mom said Mrs. Biddlespatch kept muttering about giving back to the community and the healing power of stem cells. One week later, after several more distraught phone calls from Debbie, I decided to listen to what my gut had been screaming all along. I sat Meryl down and told her everything. All the details that I knew of, at least. Mrs. Biddlespatch certainly couldn't produce her own, um, ingredients to make the soap. No, she was far too old for that now. However, and what she could do was teach me how to make it. And as horrible as it is, I believe I know just where to get everything I need. I looked to Meryl, consumed with dread and horror as my fingers willed themselves to dial the numbers one by one. I knew that once I completed this call, there would be no going back. Call your sister and tell her to come over. I instructed my wife. I let out a shaky breath as the line began to ring, setting wheels of fate into motion that I'd worked hard to keep immobilized for decades. A cheerful voice answered almost immediately much to my annoyance and dismay. Thank you for calling the Sunrise Meadows Retirement Community Center. My name is Ronald. How may I help you today? His tone of voice was akin to a preschool teacher, which I guess in some ways made perfect sense. I'd like to speak to Greta Biddlespatch, please. If she's available... Not a problem, sir. I'll connect you to the personal line in her room. Uh, may I ask who's calling? Ronald chirped. I swallowed hard before answering. <clears throat> yes. This is her nephew, Gerald. I lied. She'll remember me. This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is proudly brought to you by BetterHelp. Have you ever wondered if you were born in the wrong decade? Or better yet, the wrong century? Take for example a summer's day, playing a game of softball with some of your work friends. You're up. You feel your grip tighten on the bat all the while knowing in the deepest, darkest recesses of the collective unconsciousness that maybe it's not supposed to be a bat you're swinging. Because for a split, nearly indecipherable microsecond of perception, you felt the top-heavy heft of a warhammer, the ragged bands of leather giving slightly under your fingers, a tiny gleam of sunlight 
glinting off the hand-forged iron of the head and the brownish shadows of old dry blood on the underside of the prongs. And then, instead of the smell of dirt and cheap deodorant, you smell the sea, feel the coolness of the gray-blue expanse before you, you hear the distant flapping of sails and the creak of timbers as the longships cross the channel. So many of them, getting closer and closer. You dig your heels into the wet sand beneath you. Everything slows. You feel your heart race. You tighten your grip on the hammer. It's hungry. You can sense it. Impatiently waiting for shields to smash and bones to shatter. The long ships are closer. On the wind, you hear the cawing of rooks and ravens, already anticipating a feast of carrion. Closer. So close now. If you run, they'll never stop coming. No. Today, you will stand. You will stand, and you will kill, and you will die, if need be, before you see another village sacked. And three strikes, you're out. Well, shit. Back to the glorious modern age. There are still four innings left, but you wonder if you can just go home. Oh well. Even if you do leave, that feeling of unbelonging will probably follow. I've never had exactly that experience. But during long periods of depression when I was younger, I have experienced that fundamental feeling of unbelonging. Have you? Well, sadly, we can't Assassin's Creed our way back into different centuries, but, for depression at least, there is a way out, and better help is there to help guide you to where you need to be. BetterHelp is the online therapy service that is easily available worldwide, matching clients with qualified counselors in under 48 hours, facilitating communication with safe, private, and very convenient online environment. BetterHelp's network of licensed professional counselors offers a broad range of specializations that may not be available in all areas, including issues related to anger, depression, anxiety, stress, sleep, relationships, or whatever else may be interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals. All it takes is a quick assessment of your individual needs and you will be matched with a therapist that's right for you. You can send them a message anytime and expect timely and thoughtful responses. You can even schedule video or phone sessions from the comfort of your own home. Now, BetterHelp is not a crisis line and it's not self-help. It's professional counseling done securely online. It's licensed, convenient, confidential, and more affordable than traditional counseling with financial aid options for those who need them. So stop living in the past. Take the future by the horns, because I want you to start living a happier life today. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor at betterhelp.com horror. Join over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P, dot com, slash horror. Thank you for your support of this program and of the sponsors that make it possible. I hope you enjoyed the Mrs. Biddlespatch special as written by N.M. Brown and voiced by Jesse Cornett and Melissa Exelberth. If you enjoyed Mr. Cornett's performance, you can hear more of him on the amazing No Sleep podcast, where his vocal performances and audio productions are available for your enjoyment. Melissa Axelberth's vocal talents can also be found right here on our very own YouTube channel, as well as her own website, melissaexelberth.com. If you check them out, be sure to give them a thumbs up and leave a kind word whenever possible and tell them that you heard them here on this program. It means a lot to us. To find more of award-winning author N.M. Brown, visit simplyscarypodcast.com slash brown. 
spelled B-R-O-W-N, and you'll be redirected to her author profile on creepypastastories.com, as well as her Amazon page. Our third story this evening comes to us from author Edith Pax Boyer and is performed by Melissa Medina and Eric Peabody. In it, we'll meet a young couple who've separated themselves from their group on a school trip to a historical reenactment site. A cruel prank shows the boyfriend's true colors, while the girl's past comes to light as well as an unlikely savior comes to her aid. Meanwhile, the reenactment around them becomes all the more real. Now, without further ado, I present to you The Disappearance of Braden Kelly. I know we're not supposed to speak ill of the dead, but Braden Kelly was a monster. I can say that now, after years of therapy with someone who specializes in treating trauma and abuse. But if you'd asked me about him even two or three years ago, I would have sounded like any other member of his Kool-Aid drinking ride or die fan club. I would have told you without a hint of sarcasm that Braden Kelly was a genuine gift to mankind. That if you were lost, or your home life was bad, or you just couldn't seem to find your place in the world, Braden would make room just for you. That everyone was welcome at Braden's table. I would have told you that he was handsome, charismatic, friendly, popular, but with friends in every stratosphere that his brilliant blue eyes would sparkle with mischief and his smile could melt ice cream in Antarctica, and that when he sat down and talked with you, he would make you feel like the only person in the world. I would have told you that no one was an outcast in Brayden's eyes, no matter how life had treated them before crossing his path. In my case, I was adopted, left in the care of my paternal aunt and her husband when I was six. A New York winter took my parents. I know they tried, in their way, to make sure I still had contact with my mom's side of the family, all First Nations, but they didn't really understand. To them, a family separated by distance meant catching up over drinks and too much food on holidays. To me, half of my entire identity was trapped behind a cultural barrier that couldn't be replaced with seasonal updates and food but I was far too young to explain that to them. I had a hard enough time explaining the bullying. Understandably, because of this, I learned to avoid making waves. I made sure to agree with the crowd and leave my concerns and misgivings unspoken. I kept my head down as much as I could, so I didn't make any more trouble for myself. You know, beyond the stuff I still couldn't change. Eventually, with nothing to counter what was beaten into me by my peers, I learned to hate myself through their eyes. I drifted between worlds untethered and unloved, especially by myself. I was a perfect target for someone like Brayden. When I could barely find something to love in myself, he was there, lifting me higher than I could even imagine. So, if his jokes were a little ignorant, or his moods were a little unpredictable, or if his temper were prone to boiling over things you'd think were inconsequential, I never said a word. Because he said my skin reminded him of sunsets in September. Because he said he could just drown in the midnight of my soulful eyes. Because he was the one who encouraged me to get my first tattoo, a replica of my mother's a matrilineal mark of my heritage going back for generations. When I finally agreed, I would put it on my back or somewhere equally easy to hide beneath my clothes, but he stopped me. He told me to put it on my right forearm, where everyone could see. Where I could always see and remember. I think, I think I would have done almost anything for him. For the man who told me I was beautiful when I couldn't see it in myself who gave me a sense of belonging when I didn't even know what it meant to belong. You understand why I fell for him, why we all fell for him. 
why, when he suggested we all take a trip to one of the local forts, there wasn't a single voice of dissent, not even mine. You're going to love this, he said, holding my hands and kissing my fingertips one by one. I grinned, watching him, entranced as always. Oh yeah? Where are we going? It's a fort, he said his fingers disappearing in the inky black of my uncut hair. Like, my brow furrowed, confused. A uh, fort? Why on earth would he think I'd love that? He laughed, though, the sound warm and soothing. <laughs> like a fort, Lil. Like soldiers and period costumes and historical reenactments. You know, fort stuff. I smiled then because I knew that's what he was looking for. Inside, though, a pang of quiet dread pulled at my stomach like a heavy stone. A monument to the colonization of my ancestors and their land that didn't sound like a lot of fun to me. But I knew, or had known for a long time, that most people didn't realize how their history wasn't the same as mine. That it would never cross his mind how differently events hit when you're from the uh, other side of history. I kept that to myself, though, and smiled at his suggestion. Uh, Fort sounds like a great trip, I said, and a week later we were there, the whole lot of us, a tour group unto ourselves. The website says that it's all self-guided, gang, he said, and he swept his free arm out to the side to indicate the whole of the park. His other arm was wrapped firmly around my waist. I remember it feeling warm and reassuring at the time. Looking back, it doesn't feel the same. The way his fingertips pressed into my hips, his muscles taut around me, caging me against his side as if I might, at any moment, try to run away. After we passed through the first gate tower in the park, everyone split off into mini clusters, leaving Brayden and me to wander alone. Brayden guided me at a leisurely pace past reconstructed walls of brick and stone and rolling earthen barriers. To the side of our path, in one of the gently sloping hollows, a line of men stood in period uniforms, some red, some blue, some gray. They took quiet aim at the darkening afternoon sky with bayoneted muskets. A smattering of observers, many of them from our own little clan, watched, phones ready. In rough unison, the muskets clapped, sending up ephemeral streams of white smoke, which vanished on a frigid gust sweeping in off the great lake the park grounds faced. Dark clouds hovered in the distance, swallowing the sun and casting cold shadows over us. I shivered, chilled despite the warmth of Braden against my side. I was regretting my choice in attire. Braden had insisted the weather would be great and that what I had on would be fine, but a slouchy tank top over a black sports bra and jeans was feeling far from fine now. Two o'clock p.m., he said. Hmm? The time? He nodded toward the musketeers. They demonstrate the muskets every hour. Oh, I said, realizing he expected me to have an opinion about that. That's really cool you know that. He laughed. <laughs> it was on the website, dummy. He squeezed my hip. I told you to check it out before we left. This is why your grades are so bad, Lil. You never remember what I tell you. I felt the shame rise to my cheeks and hoped I could play it off as the cold. Y yeah, I guess I should have remembered that. Ah. He said, gently brushing my cheek with the back of his hand. Don't feel bad. My chest hurt from the tension suddenly rising in it, from the tears I refused to shed. His disappointment stung like violence. I shook my head silently and sniffed back the pain like it was all the fault of the wind. I'm fine, I said. It's just getting cold. Brayden looked up as if noticing the weather for the first time, even though the wind was ruffling his hair like it knew him. Let's get you inside then, huh? He smiled, and in the space of that smile, I felt the tension in my chest loosen somewhat, though at the time, I couldn't have told you why. He led me into the fort, or what I supposed was the fort proper, 
the one built to look like a massive house. The atrium was barren, built mostly of stone. Beyond an ancient built-in well near the far wall, it was empty of both objects and other visitors, which I found odd given how hard the weather was turning outside. While Brayden fascinated himself with the various plaques of information posted to the walls behind the plexiglass covers, I wandered into one of the other rooms. I felt him watch me as I passed. Though I wanted to find the kitchen as fascinating as Brayden found those plaques, my eyes were drawn to the large window set deep into the wall and the strange sight beyond it. The sky loomed heavy above, thick with clouds nearly black, slowly churning over the angry waters below. A dock bell rang listlessly. A massive galleon rocked back and forth on the choppy waves, its sails rolled tight against the oncoming storm. It didn't look to be moving in any particular direction, just rocking, back and forth, back and forth, driven by the wind and waves. Maybe it was anchored? I had no idea. I also had no idea what the hell it was doing out there in the first place. It didn't fit. I didn't remember there being any kind of dock outside or any kind of water-based reenactments. An oppressive sense of foreboding pressed against my shoulders as I stared at the galleon listing in the unnatural dark. It reminded me of stories of ghost ships and pirates, but not in the Disney way, more in the way that death settles over a place and only leaves when its job is done. Hey, Brayden, I called out, my voice echoing off the stone walls around me. What's up? Oh man, look at this place. Yeah, it's great, but he joined me at the window. But what? Aren't you having fun? Yeah, I said, forcing a faint smile. No, I, I just... Look out there. I pointed out the window as his arms slipped around me. Yeah? What about it? That ship? Yes? He said, his tone betraying his impatience. I... N nothing. I, I thought it was cool and that you wouldn't want to miss it. Don't make waves, my inner voice pleaded. There's already a storm brewing, don't make it too. Brayden kissed my cheek. Yes, it's very cool, very period. He seemed to think for a moment, then. Not what I would have expected in the off season since there's almost no one here, like staff wise, but really cool. Good call, Lil. Relief washed over me, easing tension I hadn't realized had been building. What else would it be but a period demonstration? Brayden led me away from the kitchen and down one of the halls. I glanced into the rooms we passed, taking casual note of them without really registering their purpose, but Brayden moved as if looking for something specific. Here we go, he said pulling me into a smallish room with a set of cramped-looking bunks along one wall, each with its own little straw-stuffed mattress. The wall opposite the door was a high-set window with a dismal view of the black clouds outside. Belts, boots, uniform jackets, and other things soldiers would reasonably keep around were hung about in ordered chaos, as if the owners had only left the room moments ago and would be right back. It didn't feel like the rest of what we'd seen of the fort. That made me uneasy. Other rooms had wooden rails and fences that kept visitors from interacting with the historical pieces, but here, there were none. What's this? It's the guard room. Are you sure we should be here? He was already slipping into a gray woolen uniform jacket. Sure. <laughs> he laughed. Why wouldn't we be? The door was open, right? I glanced to the door with all its heavy iron fittings. It had been open, yes, but doesn't it feel like this room is, I don't know, different from the rest? If by different you mean cooler because of all the stuff we can play with, then yes. He said, sidling up to me and taking my hips in his hands. Brayden, I whispered, my heart suddenly racing. Not here, we'll get caught. Brayden released me and put his finger to his lips, grinning as he slipped to the door and gently closed it. No one will even notice we're missing, Lil. I promise. 
but I backed away from him. His smile shifted to something dark, disapproval flaring in his brilliant blue eyes. I knew that look. It meant I was on thin ice. My heart raced as I tried to decide if I was more terrified of getting caught by the people running this place or Brayden's anger. Come on, Lil. He cooed dangerously, gently but firmly, as he corralled me toward one of the bunks. When are we going to have a chance to roleplay like this again? His breath was hot against my ear. I'll be the brave French soldier and you can be the beautiful Indian girl sent here to trade goods with us. So exotic and willing to trade. I registered the threat in his tone and squirmed free of his hold, trembling as I dashed to the other side of the room, beneath the window, putting as much space between us as I could. I said no. My voice came out so firm and bold it startled me, but I was proud. Indian girl? The sheer weight of how casually he had thrown that in made my stomach churn. Was that how he saw me? Was that really the fantasy he wanted to play out? Was that all I was to him? I felt filthy and vulnerable. He glared at me in silence for several long moments. Fine. He said at last, his voice low and flat. His eyes had lost all hint of their mischievous sparkle. They, too, appeared flat, and I saw something in his face I'd never seen before. Someone I'd never seen before. It was like Brayden had only been a mask he'd been wearing when he'd just dropped to the floor, and I was now looking at the face of the man wearing Brayden's skin. The monster wearing Brayden's skin. A slow, malicious smile spread across his lips, but didn't meet his eyes. For one horrified breath, I thought he was going to come at me, to hurt me for having the audacity to say no, finally. Instead, he started backing away, locking me in his unblinking gaze like a predator, watching prey it knew it had already captured. Blindly, but with no fumbling, he reached behind himself, pulled the door open, backed into the hall, and pulled the door shut again from the other side. I heard the rasp of old iron on iron. His voice followed, deadened by the heavy wood between us. I think you need a time out, Lily. Brayden? He wouldn't have, would he? He wouldn't have locked me in. That that wasn't the Brayden I knew. Was it? But then the look in his empty eyes as he'd backed out of the room flashed through my mind again and I hurried to the door, giving it several hard tugs. It was stuck fast. Brayden, let me out. My voice wavered this time. I wanted it to sound firm as it had when I told him no, but I couldn't keep the tremble out. I heard him chuckle from the other side. Not until you've had a chance to think about what you've done. He said. You've been a very bad girl, Lily. This isn't funny, Brayden. He laughed again. It was a hard, hurtful laugh. Yeah, Lil. Actually, I think it is. The scattered clap of musket fire rang out, but it sounded different this time. Less uniform than before. Looks like it's 3 p.m., he said. Just an hour until closing. Let's see if anyone finds you before we all head home. Brayden, please! Distant shouts echoed down the wall, followed by the sound of boots on stone. Then more scattered musket fire came from outside. Brayden? What's going on? Oh, Lil. He cooed, teasing me through the door. You're missing a reenactment. Are are you sure that's what it is? Well, what else would it be? He snapped his voice sharp as a slap. I recoiled from the door with a flinch. I didn't know how to explain it to him, to know that reason was on his side, but that something deeper was calling to me and telling me that this was no reenactment, at least not in the way he meant. Voices rose outside, shouts, screams, 
more gunfire. I heard feet at a distance, boots scuffling against stone. I pressed myself to the door, heart racing. Someone stumbled toward us from the atrium. Their footsteps were uneven, halting. They spoke, but I couldn't make out what they said because I, I don't speak French. But they sounded terrified. Holy shit! I heard Brayden say before grunting slightly. This is so surreal! He laughed, the sound high as if he couldn't believe what he was seeing. This looks amazing, Lil. I can't believe you're missing it. This blood even feels warm. A cold wave of vertigo swept over me. I lowered myself to the floor slowly as black tendrils clawed at my vision. Outside, I could make out formless voices whooping and calling over the screams of terror and pain. The cacophony was punctuated by uncoordinated musket fire and the occasional thud of something heavy hitting the ground. Something heavy hit the door as well, thumping loudly against the wood before sliding down in silence. Brayden? I pressed my ear to the door. I could hear something on the other side. The sound was faint and strange, wet and bubbling, like a balloon deflating in syrup. Something warm seeped under the door, warm and red. Oh my god! I gasped, crawling away from the blood creeping toward me. Something moved in the hall. Whatever was against the door slid down, scraped against the stone floor of the hall, and then grew faint, as if it had been dragged away. I couldn't move. I could barely breathe. Whoever was out there had to know I was in there. And I was trapped, locked in from the other side. Iron scraped against iron. I hadn't even heard anyone moving in the hall. The door slowly opened. A warrior stood before me, his body covered in blood, paint, and tattoos. Fresh trophies hung from his waist and bled down his bare thigh. Their scope was varied but followed a similar theme. Among them, I spotted a pair of brilliant blue eyes. I held out a trembling hand in an automatic plea I couldn't verbalize. The warrior's dark eyes watched my hand, then my arm. He said something I couldn't understand, at least not consciously, but a wave of calm washed over me. I don't know how I knew it, but I knew he wasn't there to hurt me. The warrior pointed to my arm, then pointed his thumb at his chest as if to say, you are mine. But it didn't feel possessive. He wasn't capturing me or claiming me as property. It was just making an observation. When I said nothing, he made a new gesture beckoning me toward him. I rose to my feet, vaguely aware of the distant clap of musket fire and screaming beyond the fort's stone walls, and crossed the small distance between us. Blood stained the hall in spatters and streaks. It pulled where the door had been closed. It covered the gray-jacketed body lying on its side against the wall. I didn't look to see if I knew his face. The warrior reached for me, from my right arm, and pressed his fingers to my tattoo. Then, he pushed down the leather covering his shoulder to reveal the same design. I stared in shock, reaching toward him without thinking. Shy of touching his shoulder, I stopped. It felt strange and intimate, and I smiled as I looked into his glittering brown eyes. He lifted his hand, painting my face with the only red he had. I should have been appalled, but... At that moment, I felt beautiful. More than beautiful. I felt fierce. And some deep part of me knew I had been painted not for war, but beauty and strength. With a kiss on my forehead, he finally released me. Go. He indicated, waving me toward the atrium. That way. I nodded to him one last time and strode down the hall with a confidence I don't think I've ever felt before or since. When I reached the fort's entrance and looked outside, I had to blink against the light. The cloud cover had seemed to pass quickly, 
shoved along by the lake's strong winds until sunlight prevailed again. I bathed in it, feeling like I'd never truly appreciated the sun on my skin until that moment. Oh my god, there you are, Lil! One of our group spotted me at the entrance and rushed over. Others heard them call my name, and one by one they all jogged across the field to join us, followed by a handful of uniformed reenactors and two or three staff members in plain clothes. Before they swarmed me, I gave one last look into the fort behind me. The atrium was barren, devoid of people and objects, beyond the ancient stone well built in near the back wall. No blood, no bodies, no Brayden. It's been years since Brayden's disappearance. His case is cold and confusing to the people who care to solve it. I haven't spoken with his fan club since it happened. I don't even really think about him anymore. Though, every once in a while, I do have dreams. I dream about his smile. I dream about his voice about the way he held me close. I dream about his brilliant blue eyes, staring at nothing from the waist of a painted warrior, my ancestor. And I smile, because Brayden Kelly was a monster. And in this case, I am happy to speak ill of the dead. I hope you enjoyed The Disappearance of Braden Kelly, as written by Edith Pax Boyer and voiced by Melissa Medina and Eric Peabody. If you enjoyed Mr. Peabody's performance, you can hear more of him on Chilling Tales for Dark Nights' YouTube channel, where he holds the second place championship title for 2019's Evil Idol competition. You'll find more of his work on his website at www.vikingguitar.com. Melissa Medina's work can also be found on our YouTube channel and podcasts, as well as her website, www.hearmelissa.com. Our fourth story of the evening is brought to us by author Micah Edwards and is performed by voice talents Luke Fisher and Heather Thomas. In it, we'll meet a couple hopelessly lost on what should have been a joyful road trip filled with fond memories to last them for years to come. But with their GPS sending them in all directions but the correct one, it doesn't make for a good start. To make things worse, a fateful accident locks their destines in a vicious cycle. But will they be able to break it before it's too late? I present to you The Stitcher. Are we there yet? Nicole asked sleepily, her eyes still closed. The car bumped along the unlit two-lane country road, its motion answering her question before Corso could reply. Ah, welcome back to the land of the living, he teased gently. I thought I might have to carry you into the cabin when we got there. (laughs) You still might. How much farther is it? Nearly there. Uh, GPS says 20 minutes, so we'll be there before midnight. Not worth going back to sleep, then. Nicole shifted to a more upright position, wiggling to readjust the seatbelt. Finding it too tight, she briefly unbuckled the lap belt, causing the console to flash a warning at Corso. You need help with that? He asked, his hand straying to her leg. Not the kind of help you're offering. (laughs) Eyes on the road, Buster. I don't want you clowning around when a deer leaps out of the woods or something. Eh, Good point. I bet these woods are teeming with suicidal deer. An instant later, Corso hit the brakes. Nicole's seatbelt locked up as she was thrown forward. Ow! Not funny, Corso. Corso, though, was... Looking past her, frowning out at the woods, Nicole could not see what had attracted his attention. Everything was peaceful around the car. The headlights showed nothing but the pitted road winding away amongst the encroaching trees. Bugs danced in the bright beams of light, 
I, I, I thought I saw something, Corso said uncertainly. Yeah, suicidal deer. Ha ha. No, no, for real. What was it? Nicole asked, is still not convinced that Corso wasn't playing a joke. What Corso had seen, just for a, a split second, had looked like a human figure at the edge of the woods. It was obscured by the shadows, barely visible, but he was certain it had been moving toward the road. By the time he turned his head to track it, it, it was gone. Though for an instant, Corso sworn he'd seen it, disappearing upward into the trees, ascending as if it had leapt straight up. The trees were still undisturbed. The lowest branches that looked likely to hold a man's weight were ten feet up or more. Nothing moved in the woods. Nothing, Corso said. Trick of the light, I guess. His foot returned to the accelerator. The car resumed its steady pace between the silhouettes of trees. Minutes passed. The night unspooled before them. You want to cook s'mores when we get there? Corso asked. What? Over the fire pit. There's a fire pit out back. Do you want to cook s'mores? What about going to bed? Corso made a face. <laughs> we can do that tomorrow. We can do it tonight, too. Look, by the time we get there, it'll be... I thought you said we'd be there by midnight. It should be. Yeah. Corso cast a glance at the GPS, which now showed an arrival time of... 12.30 a.m. Huh. I, I guess we lost some time? To what? The traffic? Nicole gestured at the empty road. Look, I don't know. You can read the screen as well as I can. Better, apparently. Returned Nicole. Corso laughed, shook his head, and said nothing. Anything on the radio? <laughs> Nicole asked, fiddling with the dials before Corso could answer. Alan Jackson began singing about the Chattahoochee. Uh, excellent. This'll see us home. You have questionable taste, Nikki. Listen, you don't have to like my music. You could have gotten us there on time. We would have been parking right about now. Anyway, you had the chance to turn the radio to whatever you wanted for the last, like, four hours. The song it cut off mid-word, abruptly changing to Johnny Cash. At least pick a station that comes in clearly, and Corso groused. There wasn't any static, Nicole said. Maybe they just glitched something at the station. Then find a station that knows how to play music. I'm not listening to halves of songs for the next... Oh, come on! The GPS now displayed an arrival time of 12.51 a.m. Corso poked at the screen, pulling up the trip details. There was no reported traffic ahead. No apparent reason for the delay. He zoomed out to look at the map. That's weird, he said slowly, staring at the glowing screen. Eyes on the road. Nicole reminded him. What's weird? We're going the wrong way. Like you took a wrong turn? Uh, sort of. We're going the wrong way on this road. Corso slowed the car, eyeing the ditches on either side of the road. A turn here would be tricky, but he didn't want to keep going in the wrong direction in hopes of finding a better spot. How are we going the wrong way? I have absolutely no idea. Corso made a cautious five-point turn and began heading back the way they had come. The GPS thought for a moment, then produced an updated arrival time of 12.10 a.m. Much better, Corso said, but 
I genuinely cannot understand how we got turned around. There hasn't been so much as an intersection since we got off the highway. Nicole fiddled with the GPS, looking at the map. Yeah, this is the only road it shows through here. And there are no loops or anything. You couldn't have... Oops. Uh-oh. Uh, um, the, uh, oops? Uh-oh, what? I don't know. I did something. We're on a different part of the map now. I don't know what it's showing me. Uh, let me see that, Corso said, reaching out to take the GPS from her. And would you fix the radio? This is like the, the third song to cut off in the middle. Keep your... Nicole began, but her admonition came too late. Lights blazed. With a sudden crunch, the car struck something in the road. Nicole and Corso were thrown forward as something large hurtled over the hood, smashing into the windshield and spraying blood. It disappeared over the roof as the car skidded to a stop. What was it? I didn't see it. Corso slammed the car into park and jumped out, panicked. Nicole followed suit on the other side. Both raced around to the back of the car. Uh, but the dark road was empty. Where is it? Nothing was in the ditches. No sound of something fleeing came from the woods. There was not even so much as a blood splatter on the asphalt. Corso walked around the car in confusion, checking underneath and on top. Not only was there no sign of whatever he'd hit, the blood stopped halfway across the roof of his car. It was as if it had vanished into thin air. It certainly had been no mirage, though. The front bumper and hood bore sizable dents, the thick blood smeared across the broken windshield had come from something. I guess it got away? Nicole offered uncertainly. It didn't make sense, but it certainly wasn't here. And Corso didn't have a better explanation. Yeah, I suppose so. He ran his hand gingerly over the dented hood of the car wincing as he had listened to the engine click and rattle. It did not sound healthy, but it was still running. Let's get going. The car might die on us, and if we're going to have to wait for a tow truck, I'd rather do it at the cabin. As Corso put the car back into drive, the radio abruptly jumped to yet another song. Would you change that station, please? Yeah, sorry. Nicole surfed through static and song snippets until she found a top 40 station. Corso kept his eyes firmly on the road, grateful to have the music drown out some of the grinding noises the car was making. He knew he wasn't doing it any favors by driving on, but since he wasn't interested in spending the night in the woods, he didn't really have much of an option. Besides... It was only... Corso glanced at the GPS and swore under his breath. The arrival time was now 1.44 a.m. It made no sense. How could it possibly have added a another 90 minutes to the trip? The radio station abruptly cut over to a different song, derailing Corso's train of thought. Before he could complain, Nicole said, Hey, Corso. We turned around, so we're going back the way we came, right? Yeah. Why? Did we cross a bridge before? Corso stared. Less than a mile ahead was a short one-lane bridge its metal guardrails gleaming beneath a series of lamps. It stood out in the otherwise dark forest. Corso was certain he would have noticed crossing it before. It was definitely new, and yet there 
There had been no turns. No forks. Uh, maybe that's on uh, another road and it just looks like we're heading to it? He suggested. But the GPS showed a single winding line traveling straight toward the bridge. It crossed over Red Gully Creek, according to the map. The road they were on was the only way across. With no other option, Corso drove on. As they climbed the low hill toward the bridge, the car began to make an unnerving groaning sound, punctuated by regular knocks. It lurched, shuddered, and finally stalled out. Just as it reached the pool of light cast by the first of the street lamps leaning over the bridge. Well, said Corso. He turned the key several times, hoping to coax it back into life. But the engine turned over only reluctantly and refused to catch. He sighed and unbuckled his seatbelt. At least we're at an easy landmark. While Corso took out his phone to search for a 24-hour tow shop, Nicole climbed out of the car to stretch her legs. She was about halfway across the bridge when Corso heard her calling his name, her voice high with fear. Corso? Corso? What is it? What? He burst from the car, rushing toward her. Nothing appeared immediately wrong with her. She was simply stopped in the middle of the road, pointing at something on the ground. As he drew closer, he saw the focus of her attention. A wide slick of blood, fresh and glistening. It ran from shoulder to shoulder on the one-lane road, staining the asphalt at the far end of the bridge. The guardrails were splattered as well. Of what had produced the blood, there was no sign. The only hint was a slight smear to the shape, suggesting that something large had been dragged through it briefly before being lifted clear of the ground. I'm calling 911, said Nicole. She took out her phone and dialed. What are you going to tell them? Corso asked. We were driving in the woods and we found a puddle of blood. Oh, oh, by the way, we hit something that wrecked our car, but we swear that was somewhere else. It's just ringing, Nicole said. Why aren't they picking up? Corso, try it from your phone. I really don't think... Try it. Nicole's voice was fearful. Corso capitulated and dialed the emergency services number. He waited as it rang. And rang. And rang. He checked his phone. Two bars. More than enough for a connection. He called the number of the tow driver he'd found. Again, the phone rang without answer. Something's weird here, Corso said, attempting to stifle his own feeling of unease. Let's, uh, let's get back to the car. And he turned around toward the car and stopped abruptly. Something stood in between them and the vehicle. It was backlit by the headlights, so... Only its outline was visible, but it was clear. It was no animal. It stood upright, on two thin legs, taller than a man. Its body was skeletally thin. Two long arms hung nearly to the ground, huge hands ending in sharp, clawed fingers. Nicole and Corso stared terrified and transfixed, the creature and took a step toward them and unfolded two shorter arms from its chest. It threw back its head and shrieked, a splintered, broken sound that shook them from their frozen state. 
Without consultation, both Corso and Nicole turned and sprinted off into the forest in desperate hope of safety. The forest was not sympathetic to their pell-mell flight. Branches slapped them cruelly across the face and torso, while rocks and roots snapped at their feet. Corso smacked into a tree limb with his forehead, hard enough to stagger him as lights exploded in his vision. Nicole sprinted on without him, forcing Corso to scramble to catch up. Nicole! He hissed, afraid to raise his voice too much. Nicole, wait! His head throbbed. His body stung from a hundred bruises and abrasions. He wanted to slow down, to hide and stop and think, instead of just running like a frightened animal. But Nicole was increasing the distance between them, and he wanted even less to be alone. Suddenly, lights shone ahead, and Nicole was leaping free of the forest. For a moment, flat asphalt lay beneath her feet, and then she was hurled into the air, tossed like a broken doll by a car speeding past. Nicole! Corso cried out in fear and shock. Stumbling through the trees, he fought his way to the road and crashed to his knees at her side. And Nicole lay unmoving, her body bent at unsurvivable angles. Bones stuck through at her shin and thigh. Blood gushed from her scalp, pouring across one unblinking eye to pool on the road. Already a large slit surrounded her. They, they didn't even stop. Corso mumbled numbly. He reached for Nicole to feel a pulse or possibly just to cradle her head. But he never made contact. Another hand beat him there. It was huge. With spindly fingers ending in dagger-like points. The flesh was gray and oddly lit, as if the light was fractured and hitting it at strange angles. It was attached to a long, wiry arm that extended back and up into the overhanging tree. It was the creature they had seen on the bridge. With a fragmented snarl, the creature closed its grip around Nicole's head and yanked her body from the ground. It jerked upward with a brittle popping sound, and Corso knew that even if she had somehow survived the car crash, she was dead in that instant. He could only watch as her body vanished into the foliage, taken away for the creature presumably to feast. To Corso's dismay, he realized that the light above came from familiar lamps. He was back on the bridge. He and Nicole had somehow become turned around in the woods and looped back directly into the creature's grasp. Even so, the passing car might have been their salvation. If only the driver had seen Nicole. Instead, it had been her ruination. Corso dialed 911 with shaken hands and a hopeless sensation. As he had expected, the phone simply rang without answer. He sat there by the blood, listening to the phone ring for a minute or more. He might have stayed longer, except that a rustling in the trees made him leap to his feet, heart pounding. He looked around fearfully, but saw nothing. Still, even if that noise had not been the creature, the next one might be. Staying here, where it could find him any time it liked, was stupid. He had to move. Corso set off down the road, on the alert for the sounds of approaching cars or something swinging through the trees. He opened his GPS to get an idea of how far he was from the nearest town or highway, but the app 
couldn't seem to figure out which way he was heading or even exactly where he was. The dot lurched back and forth between wildly different spots on the road, the map pinwheeling as it tried to orient to each new direction it believed he was traveling. Angry and afraid, Corso put his phone away and marched onward in silence. Occasionally his ears perked up at the sound of a distant car, but none of them ever came near. Corso thought about Nicole and about the creature. He wondered how long it would take to eat her. Maybe it would take all night. Maybe he would be safe. He cursed himself for these thoughts, for feeling relieved that it had been Nicole and not him. He cursed the driver for speeding off without stopping to help. He cursed the creature for causing the situation to begin with. He cursed the vacation cabin, the GPS, the uncaring universe that had allowed any of this to happen. A headlight shone around a bend up ahead, followed by the rough burr of a car engine. For a moment, Corso felt as if the universe had heard his complaint and relented, sending help at last. The car came into view. Corso could see nothing but the headlights, but he stood off to the side of the road and waved his arms, hoping that the driver would see him. Though leery of being hit, he desperately wanted to escape, and so he took a step toward the road for greater visibility. As the vehicle swept by, a spear of despair and terror pierced Corso. The driver had caught a glimpse of him, but in that same moment, he had also seen the driver. It was himself, driving his car, as it had been earlier in the evening, unbroken, unbloodied. Nicole sat in the passenger seat, happy and healthy. And even as the red glow of the brake lights washed over him, even as Corso turned to run toward the car, he knew it was too late. He had already seen this hours ago. The creature, unseen in the branches above, snaked one long arm down. Its talons enclosed Corso's head like a cage, the sharp points pricking at the underside of his chin. It, it yanked upward, snapping his neck like a stick of chalk as it hauled his body up into the trees. What was it? And Nicole asked in the car. Nothing, Corso told her. Trick of the light, I guess. They drove on into the eternal night. I hope you enjoyed The Stitcher, as written by Micah Edwards and voiced by Luke Fisher and Heather Thomas. If you enjoyed Miss Thomas's performance, you can hear more of her on the amazing Creepy Podcast, where more of her vocal performances are available for your enjoyment. Luke Fisher's vocal talents can also be found right here on our very own YouTube channel, where he's been narrating with us since 2012. And if you dig Micah Edwards' work, simply search for him on Amazon, where you'll find his many books for print, including his fantastic novel, Y'all Hazard. Or visit simplyscarypodcast.com slash Edwards, spelt E-D-W-A-R-D-S, and you'll be redirected to his author page on Amazon, where by clicking through via that link, a small portion of your purchase goes to us here at Chilling Tales, where we're a proud Amazon affiliate, and it helps make this show possible. In Y'all Hazard, You'll travel to Rosen's Hollow, a once thriving silver mining town that's dried up as the mines themselves. Only a handful of souls remain in the town, lost and hopeless. Dick Dombacher, a newcomer to Roslyn's Hollow, aims to change that attitude. He's got designs on the mines and a plan to bring life back to the hollow by hook or by crook but the mines have a few plans for bringing life back of their own. 
so don't delay. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com slash Edwards and pick up your copy of Y'all Hazard today. And let Micah know that I, Otis Jari, and the Chilling Tales for Dark Knight's crew sent you. It would mean a lot to me. Our fifth story of the evening is brought to us by author Grant Hinton and is performed by Danielle Hewitt. In it, we'll meet a mother navigating through the inconsistent waters of co-parenting, a special needs child with her estranged ex-husband. The parents decide to take their child on a trip and mom's new husband, Phil, and his family in tow. During their trip, the blended family learn more about their son and the world around them than any of them wish to know. I present to you the regret of misunderstanding. When the blood moon rises, the beasts of the forest will gather. They will scream when he breaks the barrier from his world to ours. All that is near will burn in his wake. That's good, Tommy. I squeeze my son's shoulder gently. His picture was brightly colored. A lake, a shoreline, and a cabin sat nestled in the trees. I tidied around his table, mindful not to touch his pencils. Three days of no episodes was a record. The empty juice box quickly vanished into my hand. But as I tried to steal away the plate with Tommy's forgotten lunch, I scattered his pencils. Tommy's hand shot out and grabbed my wrist. I felt a stab of pain and pulled away. Tommy's moan subsided as he collected up his pencils and placed them back in order. It's mine. No, it's mine. Dad gave it to me. I watched my stepchildren squabble on the sofa. Jack, two years younger than Lacey at ten years old, was too strong for his sister and tore the contraption from her hands. Phil? I called, not wanting to get involved in the usual argument. Besides, my hand was bleeding down my wrist. I unclenched it, horrified that one of Tommy's pencils had punctured the skin. Pain throbbed. Suddenly, Tommy pulled down my hand. I let him do it, curious that he wanted to see it. It's okay, hun. It's just a little blood. You didn't hurt mommy. I let him inspect my hand as blood continued to rise from the wound. Tommy hovered a finger above it, his eyes drifting from left to right and back again. Gently, he dipped his finger in the blood and examined it close to his face. It's just blood, I explained. We all have it, remember? I watched him place the bloodied finger on his picture and smear it across the trees. He reached up and did it again. I didn't stop him, curiosity getting the better of me. He dipped his finger in my blood and smeared more trees. And then again. That's enough now, Tommy, I said, pulling my hand away. Tommy's grip tightened, and he pulled my wrist to get more blood. I broke contact just as my husband's burly six-foot frame squeezed out of the office door in a tempest. What the hell is going on? He looked at me, clutching my hand and his kids mangled on the sofa. I nodded to Jack and Lacey with a silent request to sort them out. You guys need to learn to share, or I'll just take it away, he said, detangling Jack and Lacey. I took the chance to disappear into the kitchen to wash my hand under cold water. The living room went quiet, and I nodded in relief. Phil was a good father to them, and to Tommy, who was a handful at times. He knew I had my work cut out with my son. And although Jack and Lacey were technically mine now, a statement they both venomously rejected. To handle three rebellious children was challenging. Without the water, the cut ran freely as blood splashed at the bottom of the sink in ink blot formations. The wound was deep. Ashamed at myself for causing Tommy's outburst, I wrapped my hand in a towel and closed my eyes. But my peace was short-lived when a knock at the door startled me. I'll get it. I shouted, wrapping my hand tightly en route to the front door. Lacey's head rolled side to side, the VR goggles showing her a world of make-believe. Jack, arm crossed, sulked next to her. Tommy worked on his picture in peace. I put on my best smile and pulled open the door. The weather was unusually warm for May in Australia. 
the burn-off caused a haze to hang over the houses like an ominous mist. The sun, piercing through in places, made it look like the smoke had layers. Oh, hi, Mike. My ex-husband Mike stood on the porch with a rectangle box sporting a blue ribbon. Hey, Tyler. Sorry to call around like this, but I thought I'd bring Tommy his present today, you know? The eclipse and everything. Thought he'd like to see it. Um, yeah, Mike. You're, like, a week early, I said, pointing to the gift. Tommy's birthday isn't until next Saturday. I know, I know, Mike said, bobbing his head. The movement revealed a bald patch in his thinning brown hair. I just thought about the eclipse tonight. Hey, Mike. How's it going? I didn't think you were having Tommy this weekend. Phil was at my side. I I'm not, I mean... Mike wiped a hand across his eyes. I could see the frustration on his face. A trait, I admit, I didn't miss. He drew in a deep breath as he started again. I'm here to give Tommy his present. I wanted to take him to the cabin this weekend, but Tyler wouldn't let me. His accusation hit me, and I balked. Of course I said no, I fumed. You want to take our autistic son to a cabin in the middle of nowhere to watch the stars? He's six, Mike. Six. Bedtime for a normal child is hard enough. Taking Tommy out of his normal routine will ruin him for a week. Mike shrank a little, and I felt the guilt wash through me. It wasn't like he wasn't a good dad when he was around. He just wasn't cut out to care for Tommy as I could. The first year of Tommy's life was difficult for both of us. At age two, Tommy's challenging behavior was enough for Mike to leave. A part of me hated him for that. For walking away. Hey, hey. Let's all calm down here. Phil opened the door wide. Jack and Lacey suddenly at his side craned to see who was at the door. Hey, Uncle Mike. Mike raised his hand in a greeting and then handed me Tommy's gift. I'm sorry. It's just that this eclipse doesn't happen for another hundred years. I thought it would be a cool father-son thing. It's okay, though. We can do it another time. I hefted the box in my hand and turned to Phil. He had a funny look on his face. Why don't we go, too? He whispered. I frowned. Concern plastered across my face. The kids would love it. Tommy would be able to get up when the show happens, and you can put him straight back to bed after. I don't know, Phil. You've got work, and the kids have school. It doesn't happen for another hundred years, Ty. Phil raised an eyebrow, his lip curling into the smile that had won me over. The wheel crunched to a stop on the loose dirt. The drive was long. Day slowly turned into dusk as we arrived. The terrain changed from flat suburban houses to hilly forest roads. The log cabin in front of us had taken a ten-minute dirt drive to arrive at. The old and weathered thing looked more like a shack than a cabin as the sun hung over the horizon. A brown door that once could have been red stood ajar. Mike's car sat off to the right. I glanced at Tommy in the back seat between Jack and Lacey and then back to Phil. I was still a little apprehensive about the sudden trip. Phil squeezed my hand and lifted my chin with a finger. It's gonna be great. Fresh air, peace and quiet. Just what we need. The peace was short-lived, as Jack and Lacey popped the doors and raced inside, fighting each other to select the best room. I heaved a sigh, looked back at Tommy, and the new drawing on his lap. This one was of a woodland fox, its mouth wide open like it was yawning in the safety of skeletal trees. It might be good for Tommy to see something other than our home in the center, I mused. Phil grinned like a kid. That's my girl. The cabin opened up once inside into a central sitting room. Four wide chairs swathed in pale green fabric sat around a soot-blackened fireplace, a roaring fire in the grate. Stuffed deer heads and hunting tools lined the walls. Off to the right, snuggled in the corner, was a kitchenette. The unruly activities of conquering bedrooms could be heard off to the left. Phil came through behind me just as Mike came out from the bedroom passage. Where can I put these, Mike? 
Mike pointed down the corridor. Any room but the second on the left. That's my parents' old one. Phil jolted the smaller man's arm with a friendly pat as he passed. Thanks, man. I really, we really appreciate this. Oh, and hey, I forgot milk. Do you have any, or could I go to the local shops? Mike sucked air past his teeth. Near a shop, or anyone for that matter, is a half-hour drive. Do you need milk? I've got plenty of the dry stuff in the cupboard. Phil shook his head in disgust. It's good, man. I can go without. He stuck his fingers in his mouth and pretended to puke. His laughter followed him down the passage. I caught Mike's eye and an awkward silence fell between us. Tommy, who I had momentarily forgotten about, dodged free of my arms to set up his drawing equipment on the side table and began to draw. He'll be fine there. Can I watch him? You can get settled in. Mike almost pleaded with me. Awash with guilt and uncertainty, I agreed and went in search of Phil. The passageway was long. Three doors on the right housed the bedrooms, while the first two on the left were also bedrooms. The last one was a bathroom. I found Phil unpacking in the first bedroom. I've told the kids the one across the hall is Tommy's. Did they fight you about it? No, actually they didn't. Phil grabbed me around the waist and swept me up, kissing my neck. I squealed in delight and surprise. Then someone tapped the door. Sorry to interrupt, but... Mike knelt and pulled a long box out from under the bed. I caught sight of long black tubes and lens. Anger flared in my chest. You're supposed to be watching Tommy, Mike. I wiggled free of Phil's arms and pushed past Mike. I couldn't believe he had left him alone in a strange place. Tommy had meltdowns for far less. I crashed through the door to find my son peacefully drawing. Fear left me as I leaned against the threshold, my heart in my ears. Mike came through, the telescope in his arms, and an apologetic frown on his face. See? He's fine. That's not the point. You should be there, just in case. I'm sorry, Tyler. I'll make sure I won't leave him next time. He knew what my tight-lipped frown meant as he jolted the telescope and nodded toward the door. I'm going to set this up. It's getting dark, and the event is happening in a few hours. I'll light a fire when I get back. I let him slip off. My interests were with Tommy and his newest picture. For a six-year-old, his drawings were very good. No, sorry, not good. Excellent. The woodland fox had all the right proportions. Eyes, ears, even teeth were to scale. The trees around him were withered. I could almost imagine feeling the grains under my fingers. I looked closer. The trees didn't just look old. Within the lines of bark, Tommy had marked them with a strange symbol. What's this mean, Tommy? Tommy followed my finger. His pencil stopped mid-swish as he removed it from the paper and laid it down in its place. Selected a gray one and followed the symbol he had drawn. Monarch. What's monarch? I asked. I had never heard of such a thing. Monarch. Tommy drew it again. The pencil was biting that bit harder. I don't understand, Tommy. What is Monarch? Tommy drew the symbol again. Monarch! And again, biting that bit deeper on the paper. Monarch! And again, the gray nib snapped. Monarch! The paper ripped. I grabbed his hand and stopped him. Okay, okay. Tommy fought against me until I stroked his face. It's okay. I know what Monarch is, silly mummy. Tommy sniffed. I let go of his hand. He pulled the pad up until the paper wasn't ripped and started drawing. I turned away as I heard someone approach. You okay? Phil asked from the doorway. I nodded and headed outside as he followed. I'm not sure we should have come, Phil. It was dark outside. The moon fat and bloated like a drowned corpse hung above the trees. Its light bathed the cabin and surrounding woods in an eerie blue glow. Tommy will be fine. Maybe 
Put him down for bed until the eclipse. Let him have a rest. I nodded and pulled a strand of hair out of my eyes. My anxiety was through the roof. Tommy's episodes were taxing. Sometimes I just needed help. But it was difficult. I just couldn't. A scream went up inside the cabin. My blood froze. Tommy? I burst through the door. Tommy tore at his picture, hands flying as he smashed the page. Blood splattered everywhere as he screamed at the top of his lungs. I raced forward trying to get his hand under control. He was so strong, too strong for me. I grab a wrist. He pulled it out and smashed the picture again. Frantic, I pulled at his neck, trying to calm him with shushes in his ears. As suddenly as it began, it stopped. Tommy slumped forward, motionless. Tears stung my eyes. My head and heart hurt. My boy laid still. I cradled his head, made sure he was breathing. It wasn't the first time he'd pass out from exertion. This was different. More violent. As I pulled his body back, I saw the picture. The woodland fox was covered in blood. Tommy's blood. Both his hands held deep wounds, similar to the one on my hand. I could only imagine that he had done it to himself. But why? Is Tommy okay? Phil asked, coming back into the house. Just an episode, I lied. Can you take him to bed? I'm too tired to carry him. Phil nodded, scooped up Tommy, and shuffled down the passageway. A moment later, he came back, a frown coloring his face. Where are the kids? I don't know. Aren't they in their room? Phil scratched his head. No. I mean, I thought they were, but when I checked, they weren't there. A piercing scream split the air. My blood ran cold again, thinking it was Tommy. But it came from outside. Phil took off in a single stride and was through the door. I was close behind. The forest around the cabin was different. The moon was swallowed in a mottled red. I tugged Phil's arms, directing him to the abandoned telescope. The scream went up again. It sounded like Lacey was hurt, or worse, in danger. I turned around, looking down to the back of the cabin. Phil did the same, and then was off again. I broke into a run, fear gripping my heart as only a parent knows. I stopped dead upon seeing the shrieking fox stumble forward, its fur bloody and eyes wide. When it opened its mouth again, it screamed. But it wasn't the sound of an animal in distress, but a human crying for help. I clamped my hands over my ears. Phil found a shovel lying against the back of the cabin and slammed it against the floor. Shoo! Shoo! The fox screamed again and I shuddered. Did... did it just... he asked. It screamed again. Help! I stumbled back as something rustled through the trees. A hair, stick thin and red eyes, hopped out. Spittle foamed at its mouth. Its fur was clumped and matted, which hindered its movement. It jerked forward and screamed, just like the fox. What the... Phil began. I turned as an enormous beast crashed through the trees. The bear was big, more significant than anything I had ever seen. Its black fur looked sharp like needles. A muzzle, dripping saliva, jutted out beneath yellowed eyes that protruded far too much than what would be normal. Get behind me. Phil pulled me back. Hiding me from the gigantic beast, he hefted the shovel. When I say run, run. But Phil, I tugged at his shoulder. They sound like the kids. What is happening? I don't know, but the bear reared up. Its massive paws were reaching higher than the trees. It opened its mouth. The sound of screaming kids roared from its mauls. Run! I didn't wait. My heart pounded in my ears. I wanted to leave, to get far away from this place as possible. 
I tore around the cabin and yanked open the door. I heard Phil shout in agony as the bear attacked him. I knew at that moment he was dead. The door slammed shut. I placed my back against it, breathing hard. Something felt wrong, like my maternal instinct ran a finger up my spine. Tommy! I charged forward and stopped. Tommy walked out of the passageway, his hands dripping with blood. At his side were two wolves. Their fur was bristling, and its fangs bared, rib cages vibrating with their growls. I took steps back until the door pressed up against me. Tommy looked at me, his eyes focused and cleared, not like his typical sliding stare. I knew this wasn't my son anymore. It couldn't be. The wolves circled around him and screamed in a girl's voice. Lacey's voice. I broke down. Tears were spilling down my cheeks. Tommy, please, it's mummy. Come back to me, baby. We can get out of here. Tommy cocked his head. I pressed closer, the wolves continuing to scream with each step. I shuddered while my knees fell weak. Please, Tommy. My knees wobbled and I fell to the floor. The wolves were now inches from my face. He won't help you, Tyler. Mike came out of the passageway wiping his hands on a cloth. His face was slick with blood. Tommy is gone. Monarch is here now. Can you believe it? Our son. A placeholder for a god. What the hell are you? I stumbled back. Mike stopped and cocked his head to one side. I wondered all this time if you remembered. Now I know. Remember what? I shouted, fear squeezing my throat. The conception. Tommy's conception. Here, seven years ago, the last eclipse. My mind was numb. I tried to remember the conception, but there were so many times. It could have been any of them. We were young, in love. Where's Phil? The kids? The wolves edged closer, hackles raised and eyes bulging. Dead. All of them. And you will be too soon. As will I. Monarch will walk this earth again, and all that stand in his way will burn. You're crazy. I scrambled to my feet. Tommy, come to mummy. It's okay, baby. I've got you. You don't have to do this. My son turned his head, and the wolves mimicked the action. With a flick of the wrist, the wolves dived forward. Tommy, please! The first wolf pinned me to the floor its teeth snapping inches from my face. The second tore at my leg as I kicked at it frantically. My hands found purchase in the other's fur. I tried to push it off. It thrashed and rolled. I don't know how, but I kicked under the wolf and sent it flying into the fire. Tommy screamed, then a deep baritone of agony. It was just what I needed to stumble upright. The wolf careened around the cabin. Everything it touched moldered to life. Fire billowed. I crashed to the door as Tommy, head in his hands, roared. The screams of people echoed around the cabin. Mike backed up, fear etched onto his face. The other wolf turned on him and tore out his throat. Thick and clogging smoke curled around the room. I pulled open the door and raced outside. I froze to the chorus of animals screaming. Bears, hogs, birds, foxes, hares, they all screamed. The fire spread. I stumbled back down the dirt track as the fire consumed the cabin and spread to the trees. I was numb as the roof collapsed, knowing that they were all dead. Phil, Jack, and Lacey, and my boy, my only son, Tommy. At some point, I fell to my knees, distraught. The wind whipped around me as one of Tommy's drawings landed on my knees. I picked it up and turned it over. 
My jaw dropped as I looked at the scene pictured by his pen. The same inferno I witnessed before me. I hope you enjoyed The Regret of Misunderstanding, as written by Grant Hinton and voiced by 2019 Evil Idol finalist Danielle Hewitt. To find out more from author Grant Hinton, visit simplyscarypodcast.com slash Hinton, spelled H-I-N-T-O-N, and you'll be redirected to his author profile on our horror fiction website, creepypastastories.com. There you'll find his newest release in the Harry Cross series, as well as a link to all of his publications on Amazon.com. By clicking his Amazon link on that profile, a small portion of your purchase goes to us here at Chilling Tales, where we're proud Amazon affiliates to help make this show possible. In the first book of this trilogy, Counting Corpses, a gripping serial killer's thriller, we'll see that three words were all it took. Three words to devour a man. And with it, his world. If Harry loses this case, he loses everything. A man's body's mutilated, missing a leg, dumped on the side of the road. He is the first. He won't be the last. Harry Cross is on the verge of retirement when a body turns up harboring a mysterious letter. A serial killer has something that plunges Harry into the most important case of his career. His son. As his life falls apart around him, Harry is left to fight against the system he's served for over 30 years with a smattering of clues even more cryptic than the last. With each dead body, Harry receives another goading, deranged letter, all pointing to one disturbing fact. Harry must find the killer before his son becomes the final victim. So don't delay. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com slash Hinton, spelled H-I-N-T-O-N and pick up your copy of Counting Corpses now and let Grant know that Otis, Steve and the team at Chilling Tales for Dark Knight sent you. Thanks again for your support of tonight's talented authors and of indie horror. Now, our weekly descent into the depths has just about come to a close but before we go, we have one last story for you. Our sixth and final tale comes to us from author Raz T. Slasher and is performed by Melissa Exelberth. In this tale, we'll be introduced to a young woman whose lifelong obsession with a fabled pirate ship leads her to seek it out for herself. Will she succeed and come back to tell the tale? Or will she be yet another casualty of the Michigan Triangle? Find out in... Ruby's Last Raid. I've lived in Michigan my entire life. It's a beautiful place, with endless wonder on land and in the depths beneath the water. I live in a small town, and I've never for a second considered leaving. I never honestly understood that phase people growing up in small towns tend to go through wanting to leave because they feel like a big fish in a little pond. I love knowing everyone and everything about this place. There's a level of comfort and security that can't be achieved in cities of any size. One of the most interesting things about my little town is its proximity to the world-renowned Michigan Triangle. Any quick web searches will bring up a number of mysteries about the Triangle going back to the 1700s. It's Michigan's very own version of the Bermuda Triangle. While my little town is close enough to explore some of that area, it's just far enough away that none of it spills over into our everyday lives, at least for the most part anyway. Everyone that grows up here inevitably learns about the mysteries and legends of the Great Lakes, especially those that involve the Triangle. So many boats, planes, and people have gone missing there that it boggles the mind. My favorite legends growing up were tales of ghost ships, pirates, and treasure. Okay, maybe that wasn't traditional for a girl growing up. 
but I wasn't like other girls, or like other people in general for that matter. The specific legend I adored the most, the one that eventually led me to become the woman I am now, is called the Ruby Raider. Ruby Raider was actually the name of a fabled pirate ship that sailed sometime in the early 1700s. It was captained by a little-known pirate given the name Purple Beard. Her moniker was born from the scarce accounts given by those who survived their encounters with her. While the majority of those exceedingly rare accounts contradict one another in various ways, they all shared one major detail. The captain's chin and neck were covered in blood, so dark it appeared purple by the light of the stars and moon. What little records remain about that elusive pirate captain claim that her name was Natalie Bertram. She and her crew went missing along with the Ruby Raider under mysterious circumstances. What initially hooked me to the legend was a painting I saw as a child in a local maritime museum. It was of a gorgeous old pirate ship heading into port at night. The water was choppy in its wake as it approached the small wooden docks. I'll never forget the vivid use of blue and violet paints that breathed life into the entire scene, nor the fog that was creeping in from the background. There was a small golden plate beneath it where the painting's title was engraved, Ruby's Last Raid. I always loved that the captain and I shared a name, Natalie. It also didn't hurt that the ship was believed to have gone missing in waters not terribly far away from my town. I spent many of my early years trying to discover anything else I could about her and the raider, but there was only so much out there. The legends all say she was carrying something important on the ship when it disappeared, but no one seems to agree about what that might have been. It all boiled down to some kind of religious relic as I understood it. As I got older, creeping through dark libraries and hunting down old records just wasn't enough. I needed excitement and adventure. I got all my diving certifications and started exploring in record time. There are so many breathtaking places to explore beneath the waters of Michigan. Entire shipwrecks have even been preserved where they were discovered to give divers the chance to see and experience them. For a few years, that was all the excitement and adventure I needed. When I graduated high school, I took classes at a nearby college. I majored in both maritime history and nautical archaeology, with a focus on submerged site excavation. I joined the Nautical Archaeology Society, NAS, while I was there, and quickly discovered that it was the first place that I ever felt like I truly belonged. After college, I moved back home and started looking for work in my field. My mother had willed me the house when she died that year, and it needed a lot of work. I ended up taking a job at a local salvage company. I was the only female at the place with all the right certifications, but I didn't mind being one of the guys. In time, it was less of a job and more an ongoing experience I got to share with my new family. The most terrifying day of my life began innocuously enough. We started a new job for a local business, retrieving an expensive fishing boat that took tourists around to all the best spots. We'd done jobs with this company in the past, and the work itself would probably mean a short workday. We were gearing up and getting ready to head to the location when our owner came down to the dock with a change of plans. Apparently, the boat in question had been located and towed to shore by its owners, so we had new marching orders. He'd been given coordinates to a recently discovered wreckage, and we were in charge of securing it and setting up the site for excavation. Despite the grumblings of the rest of the crew, I was actually excited. According to the charts, the location was further out into the triangle than we'd worked before. This was my chance for a real adventure. The water was strangely still when we arrived at our destination, the air around us unsettlingly quiet. That was never a good sign when you were in the triangle. 
Our boss wasn't much for superstitions, though, and would have our asses if we bailed, so we got to work. When we were all set up and ready to go, I was the first off the boat. I did my final checks as I treaded water, the sheer excitement of the situation clouding my mind more than it should have. Rushing through it, I plunged into the depths post-haste. As I descended, I quickly realized a potentially major problem. We were never provided a plan of the wreckage and hadn't properly surveyed the area. At least, I definitely didn't. Glancing back the way I came and seeing a few of my crewmates following me made me realize they probably hadn't either. I silently chastised myself and slowed my descent, deciding it better to err on the side of caution. I noticed faint blue and violet lights far below my position. Despite how odd that might sound, it wasn't that out of the ordinary. I won't waste your time with the various scientific explanations when you have that little device in your hands to look up anything you please. The main thing to know is that most colors of light wavelengths are absorbed in the depths, save for blues and violets. The light source itself could have been anything. I made it to the coordinates first, no surprise there, but what I saw shocked me. While there was wreckage as promised, it was the type of vessel that threw me off. Sitting upright at the bottom of the lake was a nearly perfectly preserved early 17th century pirate ship. Fighting internally, I opted to wait for the other divers to reach me before moving forward. When they arrived, they appeared every bit as shocked as I was. Since I had more experience in the archaeological side of excavation and salvage, I took the lead. I led the other three crew divers down for a closer look. This ship was a true beauty, and there was something familiar about it that I couldn't readily identify. We dove around the perimeter first, trying to get the lay of the area like we should have done in the first place. Once we were confident it wasn't an overly dangerous area, I started looking for the easiest way inside the ship. As we moved through the depths around the perimeter of the ship, I caught some movement on the main deck out of the corner of my eye. At first, I assumed it was a fish or some other marine animal, but then I saw its outline directly. It was a humanoid shape that appeared to be walking back and forth across the deck at an odd slant. Soon, it was joined by another. Before long, several such shapes were moving back and forth. I gestured to my crew and we circled back around, each approaching a different position to get a better look. The closer I got, the more clearly the scene before me came into view. Five people, perfectly preserved, walked the deck without breathing apparatuses. Their clothing was just as pristine as the rest of them. It reminded me of traditional pirate garb from times long past. As they moved, they watched us, perhaps attempting to gauge whether we were friend or foe. I couldn't help but wonder that myself. The sheer impossibility of the scene quickly divided me from common sense and reason. I moved forward quickly, hands raised in a sign of surrender to hopefully gain their trust. Just as I moved in, they all ceased their routines and stared at me curiously, no malice in their eyes. Not watching where I was going, I slammed my head against a small portion of the mainmast. While my gear remained intact, the force was strong enough to put stars in my eyes. I shifted downward too quickly and directly into a powerful current I hadn't noticed was there. I fell faster, pulled towards the deck at an alarming rate. I thrashed and tried to turn my body to shake loose the current's hold on me, or at the least slow myself down, but there was no escape. My umbilical cord wrapped around the ship's rigging and ripped away from me as I hit the deck hard. My world instantly went black. I awoke at some point, time impossible to gauge down in the depths. The first thing I noticed was that I had no gear and seemed to be breathing as well as I did on the surface. I sat up and looked around, and I was within the ship itself. There was no sign of my crew, but I was surrounded by those I had glimpsed above deck previously. 
seeing them up close yielded no further observations. This was a pirate crew, no doubt. How they could be here, or even alive for that matter, I could not guess. Another figure soon joined us from above. Her pale skin was illuminated in the blue and violet lights, her azure eyes twinkling as she considered me thoughtfully. Each step she took down the wooden stairs from the deck above felt like slow motion as I gazed upon her. She smiled gently, the scarves and fabric that adorned her seeming to flow behind her like you might expect to see in some action film or fashion photo shoot. It was as she cleared the last step and moved to stand near me that I understood that sense of familiarity I had felt earlier. This woman had a purple stain that began at her chin, spreading downwards to her collarbones on either side. Not blood at all like the legend suggested, but a port wine stain upon alabaster flesh. She offered a hand down to me and I took it, allowing her to help me to my feet. Before I could say a word, she pressed a finger to my lips gently. The look in her eyes told me that there would be time for questions later. She led me to a small dark room in the back of what I assumed was the cargo hold by the looks of all the barrels and crates spread about. They were no doubt full of lost treasures and all manner of things forgotten by the world. Ushered into the dark room, a door was shut behind us before small torches in all four corners lit up all at once by some unseen force. The room was small and empty, save for the two wooden chairs we now sat in. She introduced herself as Natalie Bertram, not Purple Beard as I had expected. Most pirates enjoyed their monikers and employed them as sources of fear and power, but not Natalie. As if able to read my mind, she assured me that she knew of my interest in her. She claimed she shared an equal interest in me and had for quite some time. She and her crew had been waiting for this moment for centuries. Centuries? I was only in my mid-twenties. Before she spoke to my obvious confusion, Natalie told me her story. The story of the crew and the Ruby Raider. She and her crew weren't pirates after all, in fact. They were guardians masquerading as pirates to transport dangerous artifacts to various places in the world for proper containment. Their orders were to keep their secret at all costs, so they quickly made a name for themselves and perpetuated their cover story at any opportunity. It was during their final transport that things didn't go as planned. As they drifted through what we now call the Michigan Triangle, a freak storm and powerful currents sent their ships spiraling to the bottom of the depths. As they touched down, they were swallowed by a giant pocket of air. They were unable to move the ship or even leave it without facing certain death. In desperation, she broke her sacred promise to never open a shipment. She hoped to find some answers some way to end the madness and release them from their prison. When she placed her hands upon the relic, all was revealed to her. Far more than she had bargained for had been imparted upon her during that exchange. Things she could not tell me. Things that could unravel the very fabric of reality should they be spoken aloud. An oath was made between her and the power within the relic that day. She became its guardian until the rightful owner would come and claim it. Until then, she and her crew would remain with the ship to protect it. In another time, another would come. Another Natalie. She would be young, strong, and contain an overwhelming sense of wonder. She didn't know when it would happen, only that it would. When that day did happen, a decision would be made that would alter the course of many lives. Seeing me here, now, she knew the time had finally come. I was terrified as she spoke, yet enamored by every little detail about this relic, this power, this responsibility. 
I hadn't been drawn to the Ruby Raider and her crew simply because Natalie shared a name with me or that she was a female pirate. In my heart, there had always been something more, some force guiding me since I saw that painting of the ship as a little girl. That same force had guided my entire life, every step of the way, everything I chose to do leading me closer and closer to this moment. She held out a smooth onyx box in her outstretched hands. Somehow, I knew exactly what I needed to do without being told. I opened the box quickly, revealing a compass rose-shaped medallion crafted from lapis lazuli attached to a strong silver chain. I carefully removed it from the box and slid the chain over my neck, one hand never leaving the medallion as I maneuvered it. Just as it rested into place, everything around me froze. I looked at the other Natalie's lips frozen in mid-word, the flames in each corner locked at impossible angles, and the boat itself was completely still in the depths. A flood of knowledge tore its way into my brain, my head pounding as if it would be ripped apart at any second. Every movement of the water on our entire planet and all objects in life within it thrummed in my ears and assaulted my cerebral cortex. There were things unknown to mankind everywhere. Entire civilizations, undocumented species of marine life, treasures long lost and forgotten, and so much more were waiting for me now, begging me to find them all at once in a legion-like voice. My nose began to bleed profusely as my vision warped. An all-consuming burst of violet light filled the air around me, filling my entire being. Suddenly, my world went black for the second time that day. I awoke on a small wooden dock at night. The world around me was quiet. The soft glow of the moon bounced off the surface of the lake, giving me ample light to see my surroundings. I shifted onto my side to face the water as it began to ripple, choppy waves forming as something began to rise from the depths. The Ruby Raider surfaced in all her glory. Blue and violet shades highlighted it like a ghostly luminescence. My right hand moved up to my chest, grasping the medallion I knew would still be there. A sound like a deep sigh filled the air as a gentle breeze rolled over my damp skin. I saw the other Natalie step out onto the deck for a brief nod. I stood slowly and returned it with a small smile. The ship began to fade, not into the distance, but from the world entirely. I walked up that little dock and after a couple of days found my way home. I live in a small town and I've never for a second considered leaving until now. I'd finally become the big fish in the small pond. 71% of our planet is covered in water and mankind has only explored 5% of it. There are things out there that will change our world forever. There are new technologies that could save our planet, cures for the world's worst diseases, and enough treasure to end poverty and world hunger. It's all sitting there, just waiting to be discovered. They say that fortune favors the bold, but there are other things out there too. Unspeakable things. Things that could drive the world to madness with a single glance. Should you ever see the Ruby Raider or its peak-like mask from the depths in the dark of night, heed the call. Fear not its captain or crew, for they are no different than you. In the search for knowledge, we are all but ghosts floating through the ether, waiting for purpose and a chance to explore the world beyond. I hope you enjoyed Ruby's Last Raid, as written by Raz T. Slasher, and voiced by Melissa Exelberth. Raz T. Slasher's work can be found on his IMDb page, as well as on simplyscarypodcast.com slash slasher, spelled 
S-L-A-S-H-E-R. And you'll be redirected to his author profile on creepypastastories.com, as well as his Amazon page, where you can find his many publications. Last, but certainly not least, this week's stories and authors were all brought together and inspired by the artwork of the incomparable Stu Brown. You can find the art featured on this very episode, as well as several others on his Facebook and Instagram profiles for viewing and purchase, as well as his very own YouTube channel under the handle Stu Art, where you can see him create pieces of art live before your very eyes. This artist can find the beauty in any nightmare, and we can't wait to see what he comes up with next. Check him out, leave a kind word, and don't forget to tell him you heard him about here from Steve and myself. You won't be sorry that you did. I'd also like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight's episode and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012 and consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host for this evening, Otis Jiry, and as always, it's been a pleasure. Tune in again next week, when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. Thanks for joining us. You've been listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, a production of Chilling Entertainment and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted by yours truly, Steve Taylor. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Logo by Craig Groshek. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? We take submissions. Email it to us today at submissions at chillingtalesfordarknights.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to us. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew each and every week. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. We'll be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.